The following conversation is with Colonel Buzz Carpenter, a reconnaissance pilot and Air Force instructor who I was so honored and pleasure to speak to. Colonel Buzz Carpenter, he was an aircraft commander. He's uh, had experience in the Vietnam War, um, flew over 150 combat hours, uh, later in Japan serving as a flight commander and instructor pilot. And what he's most known for is flying the SR-71. The SR-71 being one of the most incredible uh, planes and pieces of aircraft technology that arguably has ever been created. Um, this plane, for those who aren't aware, called the Blackbird, uh, Colonel Buzz Carpenter was one of 85 total pilots ever in history to fly this plane. This was a two-man vehicle um, that was used uh, during the 50s and 60s. And oh, actually, the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s when they were in service, and even the 90s um, for reconnaissance during the war, during different wars, during just basic reconnaissance over places like Russia um, and, and Korea and over Europe. And these planes were integral in serving in different administrations to help make decisions of dire consequences during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s during, during those times. And we talk about all of that. We talk about all of that. We talk about uh, actually Buzz's experience, you know, as a U-2 flight staff officer, uh, as a pilot in the Vietnam War, and as a pilot, not as a pilot, but as a commander during Desert Storm. He was a wing commander during the Gulf War uh, in Germany, uh, commanding many, many hundreds of different personnel in Desert Shield and Desert Storm in the 90s. And then also, what doesn't get talked about as much, his time in the Pentagon, working as what's called a Black World Programmer, which has to be probably the coolest, most badass, uh, title that I've ever heard. Um, and basically, Colonel Buzz Carpenter, he was, well, not a colonel anymore at the time, he was managing a $6 billion budget, and yes, B, billion dollar budget during 1983 to 1985 in projects, some classified, some not, that he can now talk about. And we do talk about uh, managing the programs, uh, creating di like different planes that many are familiar with now, F-117, B-2 Bomber, F-22, he uh, had a hand, a big hand in beginning those programs and facilitating the creation of those, those planes. And so we talk about his role in the Pentagon, engineer and everything in between throughout his career. This conversation is a summary of Colonel Buzz Carpenter's career in the longest conversation that he has ever publicly done and I'm extremely grateful and honored to be able to talk about all these nuances as an engineer that he is and even talking about his time in Germany during the Berlin Wall uh, falling down and his time living there um, and how he was able to, the things he's learned, how, what he's his life over the dec many decades going through all of this and even finishing with what the future of aircraft he suspect is like and I've been asking him about the more obscure entertaining fun stuff like alien life and whether he's encountered aircraft not of this world and his opinions and thoughts on whether you know it exists and then of course times during the cold war where he was during 9-11 and um his time uh, during then. And so I really hope you guys enjoyed this conversation into one of my favorite conversations I've ever had with Colonel Buzz Carpenter. Enjoy. Been really, really looking forward to this conversation over the last few weeks. Um, I've done a lot of research. A lot, I've gone through a lot of your You've spoken to many people, 
right? Which is great. And you have quite a lot of amazing stories, except what I notice is that you only sometimes get 30 to 60 minutes to speak. So with this conversation, I'd love to make it just go into as much detail and storytelling as you have time for. Uh, I have all the time that you have. I, I marked my calendar off. It's a, it's a Saturday night here and it's a Sunday morning there. So uh. let's do it. Beautiful. Well, I think the first place I want to start this conversation with is... I think he's spying. You recall that of who said that? Oh, well, certainly. Can you tell that story from the beginning on what that mission was? It started, it was in uh, March of 1979. And as you were getting checked out, when you had your first Mach 3 flight, they gave you a Mach 3 pin that they pinned on you as you came out of the airplane when you're still in your spacesuit. Once the two of you, your the pilot and his paired navigator flew together, you threw a party for the squadron. So this is a, I got a Thursday week and the inspection team from the headquarters shows up and Normally, we would do a, a little bit of testing, but most of the team members of the inspection team weren't cleared for what we were doing. So it, it was more of a maintenance inspection than an inspection of uh, the operational crews. But that Saturday night, we're going to have a, a big party thrown by the most recent crew to have flown together at Mach 3. So the evening goes on. You could kind of feel there's a attention in the air there, there's something going on but we're not being told what it is and about nine o'clock at night the colonel i'm a probably a major at that time uh comes to me and says i, I need to have you and john my navigator come down to the vault tomorrow morning after church because they knew that we typically went to church on sunday morning and look at some stuff so John and I talked seven o'clock the next morning down here now. So I called John, pick him up about uh, 15 minutes later. We head on down and we can see the maps. It's the Middle East. Yeah. So we know, we know there's going to be a deployment, a quick reaction deployment, which is part of what we were about. But we did not know at that point that John and I would be the ones to uh, be going because we could be just doing the setup. So as it's approaching noontime, it becomes very clear. We're told, okay, the senior crew is going to fly the airplane over uh, about six o'clock tonight. You're going to go ahead of time and uh, on a tanker for part of the tanker task force. So early in the afternoon, our Around noontime, I called my wife and said, I'm coming home, I'll pick up my stuff, and I'll be on my way, which she knew something was coming about, and and I told her I was going to the east. I, I was uh, allowed to do that. Well, sometime during the afternoon, the same, same colonel who had talked to me the night before tried to find me, so he calls the house, and my uh, she was probably about seven years old at the time. She answers the phone and he asked her, do you know, what is your father home? And she says, no, my father's not home. Do you know where he is? No, I don't know where he is. Uh, can you take a message? And she says, no, I can't take a message because my writing's not very good. He asked her one more time. Does she know where I am? And I'll stop it there because there's an important reason to stop at that point. In the meantime, John and I are getting the aircraft, uh, the tanker ready, get our, our special radios on board to help with the recovery of the airplane. We'll take off. We land up in uh, New Hampshire, refuel, get meals, head across the Atlantic. And we actually land at Mildred Hall Air Base, which is about two hours northeast of London, but that was our operating location 
when we were in Europe and was also the base that we would prefer to use when we're heading into the Middle East. About 10 minutes after we landed, I mean, we landed, there was a, a, a car radio for us. We, we installed the special radio in there. About that time, we could make a call. The airplane was about 20 miles out. So uh, we talked to them. They land. But the, one of the most important things, even though we can move around at Mach 3, <clears throat> our tankers can't. So that would have been a Monday morning in England. They hadn't figured out yet um, where our tankers were going to be. The French government had just said we can't overfly France, so we were going to have to fly around Portugal and Spain and go through the Straits of Gibraltar to head into the Arabian Peninsula because that's where we were headed for. And so Monday comes because that's when we came in. Tuesday passes our tankers are finally getting location. So Wednesday, and by this time, the senior crew, he comes to me and says, fly three of these missions and they're all nine hours and 45 minutes long. What about you and John flying the first mission? Don and I'll fly the second mission. And then you and John fly the last mission. And then we'll take the airplane home. Because to bring the airplane over was only a four-hour flight. So they would get eight hours and a nine-hour and 45 minutes. John and I would get two nine-hour and 45-minute flights. So we said, sure. We come to the meeting, the operational meeting on Wednesday, expecting it to be a normal operations meeting because we're going to try to take off on uh, Thursday morning, as I recall. Well, we walk in, Alexander, and... <laughs> You have the head of MI5, the head of MI6. You have the two-star general in charge of strategic air commands, uh, air operations. You have the deputy ambassador of the United States to Great Britain. You have a number of uh, senior Royal Air Force officers and plus other officers, uh, a couple of their Air Force general officers. Can I pause you because, there? Huh? Can I pause you there? Sure. Just before we continue. What are you feeling when you're in this room with all of these like high level officials? Like it's kind of the stuff movies are made from. Are you so conditioned and used to exposure to this type of personnel? Or are you sitting back kind of a bit in awe? Or, or maybe you're not thinking of that at all? No, we were in awe. We, our normal operation of briefing would just be among a, a small group that would bring us the weather any updates, the status of the tankers, things like that. So when we walk in the room and we see all these senior people, um, the four of us look at each other and go, we've never seen anything like this before. Okay. Uh, so we get into the briefing and uh, we see the route. We'd already, we already seen the route and briefing's over with. We, we, they, they, uh, Talk to us about the uh, potential threat in the Middle East. Uh, I asked the deputy ambassador, if we have a problem, where do you want us to go? And this, the deputy ambassador turned absolutely white. He said, what do you mean? And I said, I'm not afraid of the defenses, but you never know when an aircraft's going to have a mechanical problem and I need to find a, a divert base. So he tells me right off, you can't go to Israel, you can't go to Saudi Arabia, the, the Turkish government doesn't want you there. Figure out where you, where you want to go. Our tankers, our first set of tankers would be taking off ahead of us in England and refuel us off land in, in, lands in. The second group of tankers are coming out of Spain, and they're going to refuel us in the middle of the Mediterranean. Our third group of tankers are coming out of Cairo, and they'll refuel us. We'll then head down over the Red Sea, then head along the Saudi-Yemenese border, because that's where the uh, warfare was taking place. We would then come back out. A, a fourth set of tankers would refuel us again coming out of Cairo. We would head back up along, and another set of tankers would come out of Spain and refuel us in the Mediterranean for us then to go, fly through the Straits of Gibraltar and head on back. There were some questions, either the MI5 or MI6 chief, I don't remember which one, asked a question to us, said, what does your family know about this? And both John and I said, we keep this really low key. 
you know, our wives know that we've come to the East, but they know nothing about what we were about to do. And about that time, the colonel who had talked to us on Saturday night, the colonel who had selected us to come over goes, well, not so fast, Buzz. I called your house on Sunday trying to find you. And I talked to your daughter. And she couldn't take a message. So I asked her one more time, where do you think your father is? And Alexander, in a whispery voice, she said, I think he's out spying. The whole room absolutely burst with laughter. And John and I looked at each other and said, I think we've been compromised. This may be our last flight with the whole room laughing. So, no, that was the most senior briefing I would ever see yeah. in the program. And it's because it was the first time that the British ever allowed us to fly out of England into the Middle East and recover back there. They were always afraid of an oil embargo, that if the Middle Eastern countries realized that the SR that had come in there had come out of England, they would have put an oil embargo. But by this time, the uh, England was getting enough oil from the North Fields, North Sea, I should say, that they felt comfortable allowing us to uh, fly into the Middle East like that. Now, what was that mission like? It was that the crisis mission that you call it um, that you flew for the president. Was that the one? Yes, this is the this is the mission that for the President Carter, and he monitored the whole flight. Uh, we had to change some of the rules. Normally, we ran radio silent. We were on a listening watch. They wanted to change our mission more likely to to call to recall us and tell us to come back home or to go to a specific divert base. But at the end of each refueling, my navigator had to break radio silence and make a radio call, even though the tankers were doing the same thing and there were other systems monitoring where we were to tell the president we were okay and we were proceeding on the mission. So uh, from what I'm told, he was in the Oval Office or in the White House the whole time monitoring our mission. Um, we came out the first morning. We left the briefing, as I told you about, went to the club, had a, a dinner, went to bed, and they got us up about, you know, 1, one thirty. You then had to pass a physical Past the, past the physical. Then you had a high-protein, low-bulk meal, steak and eggs. Had the operational briefing that night. And this is just a small group because the none of those dignitaries were going to be there in the middle of the night. And we head out to the airplane. We suit up in our spacesuits and are put into the airplane about uh, 40 minutes before the takeoff time of 4 in the morning. Comes up on engine start time and the crew chief comes up the ladder and says it's a 24-hour slip because of uh sandstorms in the middle east where your target area so so now we go back to our rooms and we're wide awake what does that mean wow. a 24-hour slip it means that we're going to try to take off at four o'clock the next morning got it so they just slipped at 24 hours so then you're trying to adjust your sleep habits. Right. The mates come in and go, who are these guys that are uh, kind of partying around? Go, same routine in the afternoon, go to the club, have a meal, go to bed. They get us up, go through the whole routine, get ready to start the engines. Crew chief comes up again. Another 24-hour slip. The weather isn't any better. So then we head back to our rooms again go through the same routine. Finally, on the third day, the weather, the dust storms have died down. So now we're going to be clear for it. So our tankers have taken off. And see, each one of these days, the tankers from our British base, the tankers, the first set of tankers out of Spain, and the first set of tankers out of Cairo have all taken off. Because once we get in the air, we're going to be closing at them at 2,150 miles an hour. So they need to be in place. So for two nights in a row, they've taken off and had to turn, you know, burn down the fuel to a landing weight and then return back to the field either in uh, Britain, 
Spain or back to uh, Cairo West, which was the, the base we we're using. So we found. And um, after we've crossed England subsonically, we accelerate, head down around Portugal, turn to the east, heading through the Straits of Gibraltar, and then hit our second set of tankers that come out of uh, Spain, out of uh, Moron, which is uh, Sevilla, the, the city in, in Spain. Refueling goes fine. We leave them. Each refueling takes about 12 to 15 minutes because once we hook up, they transfer around 1,000 gallons a minute to us. Well, the aircraft holds 12,400 gallons of fuel. And when you hook up with a tanker initially, you typically have a couple thousand pounds of fuel. Uh, I should say a couple thousand pounds, 10 to 15,000 pounds of fuel. So in case the refueling doesn't work, you can get to a divert base. So you're burning fuel as you're behind the tanker. So it takes 12 to 15 minutes for them to give us the fuel. We depart the tanker. And each one of those refuelings was three tankers. So I would hit the first tanker, take a partial load, hit the second tanker, take on more fuel, hit the third tanker, and uh, then we'd go on our way. Because why they had the multiple tankers, they were always afraid that maybe one of the tankers couldn't give us fuel. Mm -hmm. So they always wanted to have at least two tankers that could, because, I mean, the president, this is a high-priority mission. The president is monitoring it. So we're through, we pull away from the tankers because the turbulence that we set up as we would accelerate, if we went in front of them, we could knock out the front windows of their airplanes. So we clear, clearly move to the side, light the afterburners, we start our acceleration. It's going to take about 17 minutes for us to leave 25,000 feet because that's where their fuelings take place to level off around 80,000 feet, 78,000, 80,000 feet. This is the only airplane in the world that we climb and accelerate at the same time. So we leave the tankers doing about 450 miles an hour. When we level off, we're doing 2,150 miles an hour. But we burned a third of our fuel. Already. We had 80,000 80, pounds of fuel when we came off the tankers. When we level off at 80,000 feet, we'll have somewhere between 54 and 56,000 pounds of fuel. How long did that take you to get up to 80,000 feet from tanker refuel level? 17 minutes. 17 minutes, you burn a third of your fuel. Exactly. Wow. Because the, fa the faster you go and the higher you get, the less fuel you burn. Mm -hmm. This is the only airplane in the world that because the way the engine inlet uh, translates, and it starts translating around two point, uh, between Mach 2 and 2.2. And that's about 1,400 to uh, 1,600 uh, miles an hour. And the engine has bypasses, big tubes, six tubes that go around the engine. And as we hit those speeds, we have more than enough air in front of the compressor. So they open up these valves. The air, instead of going into the engine to be consumed, goes around the engine and directly into the afterburner. And basically what you set up is like a ramjet. So by the time we get to altitude, 83% of the air is going around the engine. The engine is kind of acting more like an air pump directly into the afterburner. And it reduces our fuel flow by about 50% and increases our thrust by 40 to 50%. Um, the Russians were always fascinated on, on how we could cruise uh, what, how we could cruise at those speeds for the length of time. But part of the secret was that inlet engine afterburner combination that, that translated itself into more a ramjet. And then when we came down, we were going back the other way. We came out of afterburner. We're now coming out of the ramjet mode. We're coming down, slowing the airplane, allowing it to cool. Because when we get up to altitude, the airplane has a, approaching an average temperature of almost 600 degrees. The airplane grows three to four inches in length, an inch or two in width. And that's why the airplane could not be made out of aluminum. Kelly Johnson, the master designer, and the team around him knew that the only metal that was practical was titanium. Titanium is as strong as steel and half the weight 
of steel. So 32 airplanes were built with titanium that was acquired from the Soviet Union. They never knew who they sold it to. The CIA set up a frontal companies in Europe and the Soviets wanted money and we needed the uh, titanium so they never really knew what it was for. I want to pause there because the people don't know the irony of that is that you guys were doing reconnaissance missions on the Russian border using the very titanium of the country you are surveilling. That is true. Which we is, never overflew Russia or Red China but we sat right on their border. Right. Let's continue with this um, mission in the Middle East. So you refuel, th th you refuel three times. I don't actually remember here what the actual mission consisted of and why it was such a priority. What did you end up doing? Well, we would climb out of the third refueling from the tankers from uh, Cairo, head down the Red Sea, and then we would turn to the southeast and we'd fly along the saudi Yemenis border. It's about 900 miles long and the uh, Yemenis and the Saudis were engaged in combat. Uh, they had ground forces, and I don't, know if they're, uh, I don't think the Yemenis had much of an air force, but they were in conflict. And what the, our satellites, satellites are really hard to move. So the SR was the only real option because our cameras were so good. So we flew down the whole length of the border. And imagine in our nose, we had, we affectionately called it the country's camera. It was an optical bar camera. But each picture, Alexander, is 72 miles wide, 36 miles either side of the center. And you're looking at three to four inches of resolution. So you can see exactly what's happening on the ground. You can see ground forces and where they're laid. Uh, you can see people. You can't see faces, but you can see people. So we flew this strip, came back around, found our fourth set of tankers, refueled, accelerated, and north of Libya in the refueling, which was a long refueling because you never know what the weather is going to look like when you get back to England. So they wanted to make sure we had adequate fuel if we had to uh, divert and they had to set up tankers to uh, help us get somewhere. So then we came off Land's End, we descend, we come in subsonically, we head back, and, and lo and behold, it's kind of light rain, the visibility isn't too bad, but when I go to put the landing gear down, the nose gear doesn't come down. So you've already been flying for nine and a half hours, you're in spacesuits. I've lost seven pounds because of breathing 100% oxygen wow. and the suit is kind of dehydrating. And um, so now we can't land. We have to go through emergency procedures. Fortunately, we have an override. There was a, a release in the front cockpit. I could pull this uh, handle. It had a cable that went into the uh, nose gear well that uh, hopefully the nose gear would drop by gravity, which it did. So we came in to uh, land and met by about 120 of the folks that were there from our wing and the base that were supporting us. Uh, what I didn't tell you in my earlier in the story, the night before we flew the mission, I had the captain's plate at the uh, Mildred Hall Officers Club. Well, it didn't sit with me. Because during that first refueling, I had a terrible attack of diarrhea. Oh, Captain's Plate, you had this big, like, what, meal of seafood or something? See, big seafood, because I'm a seafood lover. Oh. Well, there was something that didn't uh, work right. So now we're having a debate. Do we proceed? And, you know, I said, I really don't want to turn around and go back. Wow. I I'm feeling a little better now. And I don't want him to send a message back to President Carter that this mission, the third day in a row, was an air abort because the pilot pooped in his suit. So, Like one of the most decided, important missions of your life as right. this happens, right? That's exactly right. Wow. So we debated about it a little bit and decided to press on. But the tankers were aware of what happened. And to be in the SR program, Alexander, you had to have a good sense of humor. Yeah. 
great practical jokers. So as I'm coming down the ladder and I'm being met by the vice wing commander, who was the temp, the debt commander for this special mission, they had taken a black SR TITAC and they painted it brown and they created a certificate for Buzz Carpenter, the first Mach 3 turd. <laughs> <laughs> and presented it to me in front of everybody. That's hilarious. Do you still have deck, that? So. Do you have that pin still? Uh, I have it somewhere. I have the certificate. I found the certificate. Now I don't know where I where I put it. Because um, I was going to make a copy and use it occasionally for a tour. Because this has been published in a couple books. So it's uh, if people have read this stuff, they, they understand what happened. Right. That's really funny. So the once you finish the mission, you don't get the actual intel or the president doesn't get the intel for some time but how important was this information that you gathered the photos that you took from the plane in helping make better decisions um this was how critical it was when we pulled into our parking spot at the air base as i'm shutting down the engines the nose is already coming off with the camera the recorders on the airplane are being downloaded. Right. There's an awaiting airplane with its with most of its engines running. They move that equipment over there. That airplane shortly takes off to cross the Atlantic to come here to Washington, D.C. It is then processed at one of our special processing facilities here. That nose camera I told you about, imagine the film is five inches wide but the film is two miles long. Mm -hmm. So you take it into a dark room and you cut it into 500 foot lengths. And then you, with cotton surgical gloves, you go the whole length of the film to make sure there's no tears or nicks before you put it in the processor. Cause you don't want it to go in the processor if it's gonna get jammed because there's a defect on the film. So we figure, I talked to some of the uh, people afterwards, they think it, from that two miles of film, it took them about 12 hours to process the film. So you figure four and a half hours from when we took the pictures over Yemen, seven hours to cross the Atlantic, probably 15 hours, three hours to get it, 12 hours to process it, then have analysts look at it and then deliver it to the White House. So we stood down for days and we're expecting to get a tasking for a second mission well it turns out that john and i got all the pictures they needed and the president and his advisors were able to uh, insert themselves in the process between saudi arabia and yemen so now now you have probably the most important mission i flew the senior crew ended up bringing the airplane over we were a relatively junior crew. We flew the mission and the senior crew takes the airplane home. Even to this day, I, I get grief that I talked them into it. I said, no, no, remember, you didn't want to fly the longer mission. Mm -hmm. So that's what John and I did. That's, uh, that is, a, I think it's a great place to start this conversation. Do you know, historically, like, do you know what actually happened with that intelligence? What happened with... Yemen and in the Middle East and, you know, how your intel actually helped? I don't know what our State Department with the president offered, but I know that the hostilities ceased. Got it. And some kind of agreement was, uh, was struck between the two countries. Like I said, the border is not marked. And that's part of, you know, in the, from 1975 to 1981, when I was in the program. Now you have to knock out the first year because it takes us a year to train an experienced pilot with six to eight years of flying. My NAV had about the same amount of, of flying time because the airplane was so complex and you were constantly uh, studying. So you kept yourself up on how the airplane was actually, how it functioned. So if you did have an emergency, you could kind of figure out, um, what do I have to do?
airplane because some parts of the airplane was over a thousand degrees. Mm. So a sensor could break down or something else. So let's say you're flying along and your oil pressure gauge all of a sudden starts jumping around on one of your engines. And your initial impression is, well, I wonder, is, is that really, do, am I, do I really have an oil pressure problem or do I have a sensor because of the heat that is breaking down? So you had other indicators that would tell you uh, like a hydraulic problem. If you saw a hydraulic gauge surging like this, but nothing was moving, you knew it was a gauge problem. It was either the gauge in a cockpit or the sensor in the hydraulic system that had broken down. So this is the kind of thing that we train for to be able to handle because uh, heat, heat was our problem. And you just had to figure out how to deal with it. In that, that's what I wanted to ask you about that training. You had one year of training that was quite unique because you had to almost train in some ways like a, an astronaut because of the altitude, the pressures, and the oxygen mask, how you were getting air in. Um, what was that one year like? Can you talk me through that specific training? You are paired with a navigator and you're gonna go through all the training together. So typically the first uh, six weeks to two months, You'll get into the simulator a little bit, but you're going to spend most of the time learning about the systems of the airplane, the electrical, the fuel, the hydraulic, the communication, the cameras, the flight controls, uh, so that you know them like the back of your hand. At the, about the same time in there, you're going to get introduced to the physiological. What are the effects of flying this airplane? Because to keep the pressure off the airplane, because the airplane is actually very fragile because the way it expands, we flew with a cockpit of 26,000 feet. So we're in a spacesuit. It's not inflated, but we're breathing 100% oxygen from the time we start our engines until we come into land. We can bring our face plate up at, up at that point. Because just like with a diver, you know, if a diver comes up too fast, he gets he could get the bends. Yeah. We could do the same thing. So as we went to start our engines, it took us about 30 minutes from the time we were going to start our engines until we were ready to take off. So in that 30 minutes, we'd reduce 50% of the nitrogen in our blood. We typically took off and went to a tanker. And the reason for that was of the 12 airplanes we lost, Four of them had to do with tire failure. Three of them on takeoff or take, takeoff testing, and one of them on landing where the tire failure aggravated and made, made it a, a full-blown accident, which it might not have been. So we would take off instead of with 80,000 pounds of fuel, which we could. I did it once or twice. We would take off with 40,000 pounds of fuel. It reduced the wear and tear on the tires, so we didn't have that risk, but there was also another. You remember when the Concorde crashed, taking off out of Charles de Gaulle? I've heard of it. They lost the whole airplane. Yeah. And what happened there, Alexander? They had a fire, a puncture on, I can't remember, I think it was the left wing. One of the engines was on fire. The co-pilot shut down the good engine on the left side. And they weren't going fast enough. For some reason, they couldn't get it restarted. So now you've got two good engines on your right side, nothing working on the left side, and your speed isn't high enough because there's not enough airflow over the airplane. So what the airplane did, it just kind of did over on its back and in. The SR, if we had a catastrophic failure, once we got in the air and we weren't going fast enough, you lost an engine, now you have to keep the other engine in an afterburner, it was going to do the same thing. But it was only from, we lifted off, we were, we were doing about 240, 210 indicated. By the time we got to 310 or 350 indicated, it was no longer a problem. So by taking off of the lighter fuel weight, we would get to that higher speed in, let's say, seven seconds, where if we had a full fuel load, it would take us 15 to 20 seconds. So by that, never happened, but that was part of the preventive things put in there to try to keep us from uh, 
getting caught in that uh, dead man's uh, flight area. So a lot of it was preparing for refueling. A lot of it was working with your co-pilot. Um, how much, like getting familiar even with the suit, what did you spend, like was that the most frequent training that you did or were there other nuances as well that were really important? We had Gemini suits then. Yeah. That's what we had for, I think, two and a half years. And then we got the advanced suit. It's the one that's at the Smithsonian, the 1030. That's the same, quote, space suit that our shuttle astronauts used on the first four missions of Columbia. They hadn't developed their own spacesuits yet. So they borrowed eight spacesuits from us and used them on those initial test missions. But you spent the first, let's say, six weeks in really heavy academics. Now you're going into the simulator. Yeah. It's the first simulator I'd ever seen that was a computer simulator. The simulator flew exactly like the airplane. It didn't have a visual, so you couldn't simulate taking off. You couldn't simulate refueling. They had to kind of fake that, make it uh, electronic type of a, of a thing. But John and I would go down there late at night when they weren't using the simulator, get in and fly it around. And if we did something wrong, the simulator would negatively reward us for our mistakes. How important, I mean, it, how important do you think that simulator was in preparing you? Like, do you, without it, do you think you would have felt so much less confident to fly that plane? Yes, yes. Because in the end, you probably would have gotten the experience. But the fact that when you get in the simulator <laughs> later on, I mean, simulators later on, they were four hour simulators and they threw every emergency you can imagine. So if you had that emergency in flight, you were much more prepared because you'd gone through repeatedly in the simulator, just like the astronauts trained in their capsules to, to deal with uh, emergencies that might come up. Uh, you know, if you're doing it cold, there's a delay trying to figure out what's wrong. And then what, do you, what are you going to do where if you've repeated it and it becomes part of your nature? Because when you're at speed and the airplane starts uh, not following what it's supposed to do, you only have matters of seconds to bring it under control. Because if that airplane gets starts turning or anything, because the way it's put together, it's going to come apart. Okay, that's a really good point. That's that's something I wanted to bring up. You, it's a very high risk decision making that you have to make in split seconds. But when you're flying, you have three brains to consider. I mean, in the seventy one. You have the communication of your co-pilot, yourself, and you have the intelligence of the computer. How do you think about communicating and integrating and considering literally three brains all at once? Let me go through how the crew responsibility was broken up. Okay. My navigator, which we call the reconnaissance systems officer, he's in the back seat. He has no flight controls. He can't control the flying of the airplane. But the navigation system, he's responsible for. And this navigation system came from England. It was from a, a special black program that, that was never fielded. But we are the, the SR was the first airplane that had a automated star tracker. That meant that before we came out to the airplane, from about an hour 45 prior, they uploaded our whole mission into the computer and a star catalog of 59 stars in the Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere. So when we started engines on a sunny day, when we pulled out of the hangar, within two minutes, the sensor that the British had developed would look through the blue sky and not see it. And we would lock on the stars. We guaranteed our president 300 feet anywhere in the world traveling at 2,200 miles an hour. Now, think about this. This is the 60s and the 70s. I mean, today we're all spoiled with GPS. Mm. But this was back then. And also think about nobody can jam us. We're getting our navigation from, the, from space. So there's nothing up there to deny us the ability to, to do this navigation. So the navigator, if we were using radio calls en route, he would normally talk on the radio. He ran the checklist. If we came under a, some kind of attack, if a fighter or a ground missile site, he had the defensive gear in the back seat. 
So he could see that one, the system had come on and was doing what it was supposed to, and he could put in additional additional things. If we had an emergency, it was his responsibility to get the emergency checklist open. One of his big responsibilities, and one of the toughest, and the one that most often caused us to fail navigators going through training, you're at 80 to 85,000 feet. It's now time to refuel or come into land. So he has to figure out how far back do we have to start down, which is about 210 to 220. But then you have to navigate coming down, slowing and cooling to hit those tankers exactly. The idea was you'd, you would arrive about a mile behind the tankers at 25,000 feet and then hook up and refuel. That was his responsibility. The refueling was mine. It was visual. I would see the tankers. I would pull into position. There's lights on the bottom of the tankers that would tell me to come forward or aft or up or down. There's a boom operator. He or she is laying on a couch, and they fly this boom down to the back of the air refueling receptacle that's open, and then they start passing fuel. Like I said, 1,000 gallons a minute earlier. But something also that was amazing with this airplane, we could talk to the tanker through the boom. It had a communication link that the outside world couldn't hear. So we could pass on information. They would ask us questions. Uh, they were almost always asking us uh, to give us an update for their navigation systems because ours was so accurate. Buzz, how tricky and high stakes was that moment every time you had to refuel? Because, you know, minor errors in movement, you know, you could. what's the chance of like a mid-air collision or, or a... Um, I know the fuel can't catch a light. Correct me if I'm wrong, because it was a special type of fuel, right? It, it normally didn't burn very well. That's correct. Now, how tricky was it? Or maybe it wasn't as tricky with, with enough experience. And in your head, how are you thinking like, okay, I really have to be careful here. I have to get this precisely right. You had a, a little area that you needed to be in. And you'd done it enough times. Now, daytime... With a clear sky, Alexander, it, it was fairly routine. Okay. But now do it at night in the weather, in turbulence, and you know you have to get that fuel or you can't get home. Yeah. Uh, it got really sporty. And uh, so you had your hands full to uh, stay in position and uh, find the tankers because sometimes the visibility is really poor. There were times where the weather was so thick that I knew I was holding my position correctly, but for a moment, I couldn't see the tanker. I could kind of see part, my back seater could see part of the pipe, but the weather was so thick, we'd lost sight of the, the lights on the bottom of the tanker. Wow. But it was, fortunately, it was just momentary. I didn't have to break away yeah. uh, because, and there have been collisions, you know? Uh, I don't say we have them every year, but uh, particularly people in training, to teach them to refuel, uh, it's not uncommon to have uh, minor collisions with uh, one of the airplanes. Now, if you have a minor collision, well, it is minor. It, it's it's a like, but is it like what can actually happen in the air with a mid-air collision? I, you, you can you can lose one or both of the airplanes early in the SR program. Um, a crew was refueling, I think, over El Paso, and something happened. We don't know if the airplane all of a sudden pitched up, but it was underneath the tanker. So as it pitched up, it knocked the nose off the SR. Now the crew, the tanker tail was damaged, but he successfully landed. The crew in the SR-71 successfully ejected because oh, wow. the yeah. airplane w was not flyable. And that, that plane just nose dives then into the ocean or the land? Like, what did you guys uh, recover it that? Nose dived into some desert area, uh, I think west of El Paso. Is that important valuable technology then you got to go in and grab yes <laughs> i imagine the, the team had to go in and uh, dig up all the pieces and uh and make sure that nothing was left behind because this is the sr-71 is america's first stealthy airplane yeah president eisenhower's number one requirement he wanted an airplane that didn't fly at 450 miles an hour like the u-2 because he knew they were having trouble overflying the Soviet Union. 
They didn't want the advanced aircraft to fly at 70,000 feet. They wanted it at 85 and possibly above. But his number one requirement was, I want an airplane that Khrushchev can't see. And they were successful. Um, well, okay, let's, let's go to that then. Um, the Cold War, critically important to gather intelligence uh, to potentially ward off really significant consequences and give you the upper advantage. Um, what was the general air and feeling that everybody had around you in the military during that time? Like, what did it feel like? Well, we knew that the Soviet Union, um, not so much the, the Red Chinese, but that they had uh, capabilities you had to respect. But the Soviet Union had some very capable, I mean, I couldn't tell you how many times that I'd be flying on the border of the Soviet Union and MiG-25s would come up and try to intercept us. Uh, later on, pilots and crews after me, I never saw a MiG-31, but they started flying the MiG-31s. You had a great sense of accomplishment, Alexander, when you flew these missions because they weren't training missions. I flew 65 plus missions in these airplanes. And you knew when you got back and they downloaded the information that you'd collected that it would help other airplanes and would help our intelligence people to better understand what was going on. Um, if it was a crisis that was developing, like the thing with Yemen, uh, in the Arab-Israeli War, 1973, the Europeans would not allow us to fly out of Europe. This is before I was in the program. So SR-71s flew from the East Coast of the United States all the way into the Middle East because none of our satellites were in position. So 95% of the pictures that the president used to figure out what was happening in that huge conflict in 73 came from SR-71s. And those were the longest missions we flew, 11 hours and 20 some minutes, uh, five to six refuelings, depending on uh, what they were doing. So and everybody was tied to it. I mean, your people, uh, maintaining the aircraft, preparing the airplane, the mission planners. You were a, one big team. I mean, the pilot and the RSO, our navigator, I mean, we got a lot of focus because we're the ones that flew the mission. But there was this tremendous group along with the tankers that they all had to come together and they were all dedicated because it, in the history of the program, we had almost 26,000 refuelings, about 3,600 operational missions. None of us could ever remember a time that when we needed a tanker, a tanker wasn't there. So these tanker crews would do anything that they could to get there and be there to give us the, the fuel we needed. Yeah, and that is absolutely one of them. I think that's such an important point to make um, because without them, then the whole none of the missions really function. <laughs> you, you can't go very far. You can only fly for about two hours. Exactly. So how, how, how are you feeling during the Cold War? Like, you know, are you enthusiastic to, you know, go on your missions and do what you need to do? Or is there always an element of uncertainty and fear that you have to overcome? Uh, I don't ever recall any fear. Um we felt that the SR-71 was so advanced that uh, I never had a missile fired at me, but guys did have missiles fired at them. I had fighters come up, but the probability of any of them ever really getting any kind of a shot and losing an airplane in operation was really pretty slim. Now, that doesn't negate the fact that you might have an airplane that has a maintenance problem uh, that could put you in a vulnerable way which fortunately uh, never happened. I had a uh, major emergency along the Korean DMZ, but I was south of the DMZ so I could recover the airplane at one of our air, air bases in South Korea and get maintenance to come up and work on the airplane. Um, and any of the overflights I had, I never had any problem. The airplanes always performed the way the way we the, they were designed to perform. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, you know, your feeling was... Yeah. To have the information that the Soviets were tough 
a tough competitor, but if you could get inside of their kind of their decision making and have our leaders smarter than what their leaders were looking at, that somehow this would start to resolve resolve itself. Well, and, during the '60s, Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev and Kennedy, um, it was just pulling up here. You know, you had U two planes flying over Cuba to get important intelligence. Um, exactly. <clears throat> what? Do, what do you remember from from that and, and your either involvement or involvement of personnel that you knew back then? I was in college at the time. It was, it was I was in a, a college in California before I would be accepted to go to the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was a pretty tense time. You know, they put B-52s up on what they call Chrome Dome. They were on nuclear alert flying over around the North Pole in case something happened. You know, the Soviets had submarines and stuff that were coming in. Uh, you, you mentioned the U-2. Matter of fact, that's when uh, uh, Rudy Anderson got shot down by a, by a uh, surface-to-air uh, two uh, missile. And it, it was really pretty tense. But you also had a, a kind of a breakthrough with Kennedy and Khrushchev, kind of. I've done some studying after on on some interesting documents and one of the most interesting things that i didn't know about was that during world war ii khrushchev was in charge of the soviet army corps to defend to defend stalingrad he had two german corps coming at him and he asked stalin he said you know we're going to get annihilated will you allow me to pull back from stalingrad regroup and then come at the Germans when we're better prepared to, you know, deal with them. Stalin said, absolutely not. So he had to defend Stalingrad against these two German corps. Now, eventually, you know, the, the Germans suffered terribly. But Khrushchev lost half a million men. Mm. And one of the history lectures I was in for this intelligence group I was doing for the government uh, for a number of years was that, this played on Khrushchev's mind, and he saw in Cuba the folly if we got into a nuclear exchange. And they had submarines out that had missiles. They had, you know, they had uh, actually nuclear short-range missiles that were based in, in Cuba. We didn't know it at the time. So he kind of backed. He looked for a quid. The quid was Kennedy offered him the four missiles we had based in uh, Turkey, which we were going to take out anyway, Alexander, but it gave Khrushchev saving face. Mm. He could tell his people, okay, we're going to take those offensive missiles out of Cuba and the Americans are taking their offensive missiles out of Turkey. So that there was a quid. Yeah. That's, that's so the reconnaissance we did basically provided the president updates on what was happening on the ground in Cuba yeah. so they could kind of figure out as they went through the, what do they call it, the 11 days in May, the different pieces of it until it finally was resolved that uh, they would withdraw because we also put up a uh, naval blockade. Such an incredible time in history that I think – doesn't get talked about much anymore, especially in my generation. And it's really interesting to hear you talk about it. Um, I want to shift to another high tense situation. And sure. that is when I heard you were flying on the border of North Korea. Um, can you take us back to the story of when you had to do that from the time you were debriefed to the time where you had to get back home and everything in the middle? This was, a, <clears throat> was supposed to be a fairly routine mission. Uh, John and I took off from Okinawa, Japan, came up and um, swung out over the Yellow Sea. And then we're coming up because the accuracy of our navigation system, again, because we're navigating off the stars, we flew as close to the DMZ as any American airplanes were allowed to fly. So we're coming in. And all of a sudden, John tells me, we just had a near miss with something. 
And about that time, I start, remember I told you that the airplane converted itself into a turbo ram type of a, a thing? What does that actually mean, though? That's when the air is bypassing the core of the engine, okay, got 83% it. Okay. of it, and producing right into the afterburner, which is the most efficient way to do it. it. So we're in a turn, and all of a sudden, one of the inlets starts misbehaving, and what you get was called an unstart. Well, now you have one side of the airplane, one engine inlet producing 100% thrust, the other side producing about 30% thrust. What happens, the airplane tries to slice on. In this case, it was trying to slice up. And it can pitch up on you. And if it pitches up on you and you don't correct it uh, almost immediately, you could lose the airplane. So we went through a series of unstarts. And according to the my emergency procedures, what I needed to do, Alexander, was get the airplane out of a turn, roll it out, stabilize the inlets, and then continue. Well, if I'd rolled out of the turn, I would have overflown North Korea. It was a potential diplomatic issue. Hmm. So I had to continue to fly the airplane through these, the turn, continue to have these unstarts. There were seven of them. The airplane gets twisted because of this difference between the two engines. I break one of my major hydraulic lines. So now I can't return back to Japan. So we send out, John sends out a message that, because I've selected an, a US air base, what we're going to go into. And then it's up to the world to contact the base to let them know that they're coming in because we're obviously their highest priority. And uh, I made a safe recovery at Osan Air Base, which is about 50 miles south of uh, Seoul. Talked to them back in Japan. They had to send a team up to repair the airplane before we could uh, fly it back to Japan and put it back with it. At any time in Japan, we always had three airplanes there because that's where we did, most of our operational flying was in the Far East. And wow. The Vietnam War had a lot to do with it earlier on. But by the time I came into the program, you know, the Vietnam War was long over. I, I flew into Vietnam War, but it was in, in tactical reconnaissance, RF-4s, yes. which you more commonly flew at, uh, 200, 500, 1,000, uh, 5,000, 10,000, or 20,000, depending on what camera you had and what they were asking for. And I definitely want to talk about that. But before we go to that, um, when, you're, when you're in that moment where you have this diplomatic and operational conflict where you could damage the plane, you might have to eject, or... You can flatten the plane out, but you go over the border. Is there any, like, what do you feel? Is there any room even f to feel like high stress? Or is it just, I got to follow my procedures step by step by step? How do you deal with that in your head? There's stress, uh, but you know that the diplomatic rules trump all else. Because we don't want an airplane that could potentially fall, particularly in the North Korean hands. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a Navy uh, EP-3 that landed on Hainan Island uh, because the crew, I think, used poor judgment after they'd had a mid-air collision. A uh, red Chinese fighter had, uh, had uh, impacted them, and they were trying to get either to Taiwan or uh, the Philippines, and the, the pilot decided the airplane wasn't that flyable. Of course, it had all kinds of information on the airplane that was extreme value to the Chinese. So, uh, no, you, you didn't really have a choice. That's why when people ask me, what were some of your most demanding missions? Yeah. They're actually our, our peripheral missions because you were not authorized to overfly that adversary you were looking at. If you're doing an overflight, like I did a number of Cuban overflights in, in the Middle East and elsewhere, You've already been cleared to overfly. So if you have to uh, deviate from your path because of some aircraft problem, uh, there's no diplomatic problem because you were already overflying their country. Uh, where if you violated and went over a country that you weren't supposed to go over, there could be diplomatic uh, problems. And why were you flying over the DMZ? Like, what were you trying to gather? Were you trying to see, like, military movement, nuclear, potential um 
you know. Well, give me an idea. With that camera, I can see 36 miles into the north. Yeah. And 36 miles in the south. If I'm if I'm carrying my radar mapping mapping the ground, I can see a hundred miles. Now with a hundred miles, I can't see uh, with radar. I can't see you, and and with the optical, I could identify a truck or a tank. With the radar, I'd have to say, well, that radar return is about the size of a tank or a truck, but I could see a hundred miles in. And it didn't matter if it was day, night, weather. The radar would work. At the same time, because of the altitude. Let's say there's a, a radar that they use for defense that's 200 miles from me. I can pick it up and I can tell you exactly where it is. And I can tell you what kind of frequencies it's working. I can see out to about 320 miles in any direction. We were the greatest collector of our time because we were like a huge vacuum cleaner going through. And uh, matter of fact, sometimes we flew what was called a coordinated mission. And what we did, we were the target. This was particularly against the Soviet Union because they really wanted to shoot down an SR. So what we would do, we would not overfly them, but we'd come at them in a kind of a provocative way to stimulate them. Well, as we were stimulating them, there were satellites overhead. There were other airplanes in flight. There were ships at sea and ground sites all tuned, watching us and collecting all the information because the Soviets often would come up on frequencies they never used for any other airplanes or any other threat. And they, we thought they were probably wartime frequencies or they would, they would come up with a radar site or they'd scramble some fighters and we could get information on how long did it take them from the time that we stimulated them until those fighters could uh, get somewhere where they could try to make an attack. That's really clever. So basically, you were provoking, right? Exactly. The foreign potential enemies and using that against them. It's very, it's very smart. And when you're on these missions, is the main purpose general reconnaissance or are you generally looking for something? Oh, we're always looking for something. Uh, there'd be a, 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 a uh, target catalog that had been loaded and the cameras that would do the best they could or, or whatever sensors or radar that you were looking at. And sometimes, Alexander, I've flown missions against a lot of Vostok and up in that area and uh, inside the Kamchatka Peninsula where the Soviets were told ahead of time by our air attache in, in Moscow, oh, by the way, there's going to be an SR-71 about uh, noontime tomorrow near a lot of Vostok. And the whole thing was, to get a greater reaction out of them. And it worked. You can see, you can see how comfortable they were, yeah. that they felt that uh, we were just, uh, just about invulnerable. Wow. And when, like for the North Korean mission, um, what was the information you were trying to gather there? Because they had large army units, surface air missiles and other yeah. things along the DMZ, north of the DMZ. Yeah. So you're always looking to see if there were moving, moving units around uh, because, you know, there was an armistice in Korea, but there was never a peace treaty. So they were always concerned about a flashpoint. And occasionally there have been, you know, they sunk that South Korean uh, military boat about five years ago. Uh, the North Koreans at times, I've studied them for over 40 years and dealt with them. Uh, sometimes they're very unpredictable. Does that worry you today? And for the your, your, I mean, your children and your children's children, like how concerned are you as like a, just a citizen or an, an, and a former, you know, military, uh, you know, uh, colonel um, of a potential major conflict with someone like North Korea or Russia? Not so much with Russia. Uh, uh, I mean, Putin. Uh, can push here and push there and and but he he's not a, a, a huge risk taker he takes calculated risks that he kind of knows the boundaries hmm. uh kim il Sun is a wild card yeah you just don't know from that family i mean he killed his uncle using a anti-aircraft uh, gun you know i mean this guy is uh and his father and grandfather were very much the same. Uh, they would do things um, 
to generate local support? I mean, because the people are in pretty bad shape in North Korea. I mean, you've got an elite that is living wonderfully, but you've got a lot of people out in the countryside that uh, live pretty marginal lives. Hmm. Do you do you get concerned? Like of the, um, I mean, that story. That's right. You said about his uncle. Why? Why did he do that? Do you know? Because I'm, you know, we we don't know for sure the whole story, but the story we were kind of told is that there was a feeling that his uncle had gotten too close to the Chinese. Oh wow! Because I mean, the Chinese basically keep North Korea alive because of the trade and giving them oil and doing all kinds of stuff. So uh, it's um. What would you say? Uh, what I would say is the spoiled child syndrome. Hmm. You think China that- is that parent that uh, kind of keeps them on life support and keeps going, but the child is going, I don't like this, but I can't get away from it. And uh, if you're getting too close to my uh, source, uh, I'm not sure I can trust you. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. It's, it's a wild card, like you said. Um, I want to ask about, you know, I, in preparing for this conversation, um, you said and noted one of your scariest moments uh, in your pilot career being Okinawa. I wonder, is that still, do you feel, still feel that way? Wait a minute, say that again. One of the scariest moments in your pilot career, um, the Okinawa mission. Do you recall? Um, that was supposed to be a coordinated mission. And uh, it was very high priority. It wasn't from the president, but it was it was way up there yeah. because to have the satellites in the right position, to have all these other airplanes and everything. And there was a not a typhoon going through, but really terrible, you know, gusting winds to 50 or 60 miles an hour, driving rain, the tropics. And uh, John and I are the backup crew and we're looking out from the hangar. And we're saying, boy, I'm sure glad we're not flying today. This is really ugly. Well, the number one airplane gets out there. And because this airplane is loosely put together, what had to grow. Well, the, the number one airplane, all of a sudden, they have an electrical problem. So now we're tasked to go. We get to the end of the runway, and I can't see – I can see maybe 150 feet down the runway. I mean, the rain is just absolutely driving. So I call ops and I said, okay, what do you want me to do? And the uh, commander comes back and says, I've just talked to Washington. If at all possible, you were to take off. Well, in the meantime, the two-star general in charge of Okinawa and the airfield has closed the airfield. As far as he's concerned, nobody is to land or to take off. So I'm kind of in between a squall and I can see probably about two soccer fields in length and we take off. We head on up. The general is not happy. I find that out later. We go up and refuel. But then when I go to light the afterburners, one of my engines, the afterburners won't work. I tried everything I knew. And so now I've got to go back into that airfield that I just left that was an absolute mess. So as I'm starting to head back in, I'm starting to have electrical problems. And I contact approach control. My uh, instrument landing system isn't really working that, that well for some reason. So I pick up a radar approach. So this guy is guiding me down. Well, Kadena Air Base, this huge air base on Okinawa Air Force Base has parallel runways. So this guy is bringing me in, and the ceiling is probably about 300 feet, maybe 400 feet at most. What does Uh, that mean? What do you mean by that? From the ground, you can only see up about 400 feet. Uh, So now you're trying to come in and land an airplane with these conditions in heavy heavy rain. He lines me up on the wrong runway, and as I break out to land, there's a DC-10 sitting on the runway full of passengers. About that time, my attitude indicator quits. They fire the controller because he won't talk to me because I told him, I said, there's an t- aircraft on the runway. So I have to fly around underneath the weather 
which is really difficult in a normal airplane, but in a spacesuit with this airplane, with the visibility is very limited. The good news was this was where I, the base that I used to fly out of before I got in the SR program. Mm -hmm. So I knew the ground track very well. So I could watch the ground and I knew where the towers were and I could just kind of fly that track around and come in to land. I landed successfully <laughs> and I pulled it in to park it. And I just told my, the commander, I said, I don't ever want to do that again. Wow. Cause that was really pretty hairy. Now I, I topped it once, uh, almost equal I flew a mission out of Mildenhall and I can't remember where we went, but we we're coming back and it was at night. There had been a series of uh, thunderstorms. The instrument landing system had been hit by lightning, so it didn't work. Uh, all the Air Force bases in England were below minimums. Now, if you're a regular Air Force pilot, if the airfield goes below minimums, what does Alex, that mean, you have below no minimums? Choice. Now, whatever the weather minimums. Okay. You know, how much ceiling do you have to have and how much forward visibility to safely land the airplane? So, if you're a regular Air Force pilot, when it goes below the minimums for that particular runway with the type of approach you're doing, you have to go somewhere else. Okay. For SR pilots, we were allowed to fly and see if we could land the airplane. The radar controller, a British fellow, great controller, he gets me in, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, I saw the airfield the runway at the very last minute he forgot to tell the tower that i was landing so we roll out on the runway but the fog is so thick i can't find the taxiway so I, john calls the tower and said we needed a uh, a truck to come out and lead us in and the tower goes who are you and where are you we're closed and he said well you may be closed but we're we're a tactical airplane sitting on your runway. So come carefully. It's night and a black airplane. Don't run into us. So, because two days later, we were flying a very important mission um, for somebody in Washington, D.C. They wanted me to go to Spain. Well, they had a tanker airborne for me to give me enough fuel to get to Spain. But if I'd gone to Spain, it would have taken them two or three days to send a team down to prepare the airplane to fly back to England, and, do, and we'd, we would have been late on the mission. So, I would, again, this sense we tried to do what they wanted us to do, if at all possible. Uh, even if that was obviously at a high risk to your life, or, well, the, or the there was there was a there was a risk associated with it. Of course. How, how do you manage like weather? Sounds like because people think as a pilot, you know. Other planes, surface-to-air missiles, they are one of the biggest threats. But for the SR, you can just accelerate and you can go on speed and altitude. Yes. But weather... Affects you all. Exactly. That's right. What, what are your standard operating procedures for managing the chaos of weather, especially things like lightning? What do you do when lightning hits a plane? And what can it do to a plane? The planes are designed to be able to take hits from lightning. Okay. It, it, they, uh, sometimes they could knock out some of your systems, uh, sometimes permanently. Most of the time, it's just a, an interim type of a, you know, of, of a surge. Um, normally, it doesn't do any damage. When I, I've been hit by lightning in 141s I flew by RF4s and probably by the SR-71. I just, when you're flying by yourself, you never know. Uh, but it's not hit, like a I, la it's not like a big booming sound through the plane. No. So it disperses it's it really well. Flash, wild. like in the the slower tactical airplanes I flew, you kind of had a flash that oh well, what, what, did we get hit? Um, <laughs> wow! And that was and that was it. Now one time there were two of us flying. I was leading another RF four coming out of Korea, and we were hit by lightning. And I thought it was he got hit by lightning. So I said, are you OK? He thought I got hit by lightning. <laughs> are you OK? Wow. And when we landed, the wing lights that were inboard of the two of us were melted. So, you so we both had been both hit. hit by lightning at the same time and oh, it melted man. the inboard lightings. Wow. 
Wow, I wouldn't think that a plane is that rob would you, No, the SR-71s, yeah, that makes sense. But what about other fighter jets? Are they also just as resilient to lightning? They are. They are. And you're commercial. When you go fly, the way they design our commercial airplanes, if it takes a lightning strike, the, the body of the airplane is to carry the the electricity through the airplane and then drop it off wherever it uh, leaves the airplane. Okay. I want to now um, talk about Vietnam. You uh, you flew in the Vietnam War. Um, I did. What made you decide to fly in the Vietnam War? Like, I was flying transports, 141s. I had a worldwide mission. Matter of fact, I learned a lot about flying in those two years that I was a transport pilot. Mm -hmm. It was the Air Force's biggest transport at the time. The C-5 had not come down. And I flew worldwide every month. Uh, typically, part of the month, I'd be in the Pacific Theater. The other uh, part of the month, I'd be in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. And you just landed in a lot of different places. You learned a lot of different things on how these airfields were. But the Vietnam War was going on, and I really felt that I, I wanted to contribute more directly. So I volunteered to go to Vietnam. And if you were a volunteer back then, they tried to get you the airplane you wanted to fly. Well, I wanted to fly a fighter because I wanted to fly something that, you know, I could really move around. It turns out I became one of the youngest aircraft commanders flying the transports. And that gave me the gateway to be accepted or that I was qualified to go into fighters. Well, there were no fighters available. And when they called me, they said, you know, we have to, you're a volunteer. We're going to have to, uh, give you an assignment, but I apologize. There's no fighters, but we have RF-4s. Mm. Well, I said, wait a minute. It's an R with an F-4 fighter. That can't be all bad. You know, I, Alexander, I had no idea what an RF-4 did, but that's what introduced me to photo reconnaissance, uh, some early uh, radar reconnaissance and other sensors. And one thing led to another. I flew those for five years. It was actually when I was in the RF-4 program that I met a then Colonel, Jerry O'Malley. He had flown the first SR-71 operational mission hmm. ever out of Okinawa, Japan, any operational mission. And um, I worked for him. And he kind of took me under his wing and said, you know, you're the kind of guy I think we'd like to have in the program because he knew he was going back to become the commander back there. And he said, you're just too young. What do you think you he saw in you? a lot more. Like what characteristics did you embody that he saw in you? Um, I had air refueling experience. I was flying a, um, the RF-4 could be a very challenging airplane. Mm -hmm. When you're flying at 560 knots at, um, you know, 300 feet off the ground, uh, things happen fast. So you, your mind has got to be, you know, you're racing ahead to where you're going. So if something should happen, you you hopefully could help to, to compensate for it. Uh, in that case, people are shooting at you too, uh, which obviously uh, adds to the uh, the complications that uh, one might have. Um, so he kind of got me interested. He made no promises. He just said, if you're, if you're interested. So I stayed in the RF4 program because that was a good place to be, and it, it uh, kept developing my skills, and then applied for the program. And uh, he left a word uh, from the SR program that, take a look at your record. You had to submit your personnel record, your flying record, and your medical record. And they would do a review in California and say, okay, this person looks like he's uh, probably – could be qualified. So then they bring you back for a week long, a two day astronauts physical, a whole series of interviews. As a pilot, I had to fly with two current SR pilots in the companion trainer, the T-38, because the SR-71 is a low G airplane. When, when the airplanes heated up and were cruising, if you can imagine, it's 1.7 Gs. You pull more than that when you go on a roller coaster. Because that, that limits us to a 45-degree bank turn, because that's 1.7 Gs. 
Now, when the airplane's cold, we can pull three Gs, but compare that to an RF four, where I can pull seven and a half Gs. Okay, what does pulling seven and a half Gs feel like? Well, think about you're in your seat and you're just getting pushed down because now your body weight effectively for every G, like two Gs, you're doubling, three Gs, you're tripling. You. So by the time you get up to seven Gs in a fighter aircraft, or you're doing maneuvers, if you're not careful, you can black out because you really need to keep your body aligned so that you're, because the blood is now having a hard time pumping up into the, uh, into your brain. Uh, and the technique you do, what is that called to, to help? You wore a belt that was air inflatable. Yeah. So when you yeah. hit about four, four and a half Gs, this belt inflated, which helped push the blood out of the main part of your body up into your upper extremities, up into your head. Was there a breathing? I've seen breathing techniques sometimes pilots do. Did you have that? Um, you could. You, what you normally did was, if you knew you're gonna, you're you're controlling it. You'd kind of take a deep breath and then kind of tighten your stomach muscles because that would also help um, move the blood to where you needed it. Because normally you don't pull G's for a long time. Yeah. You know, yeah. five to ten seconds. Because you can move an airplane quite a distance in that time period. Absolutely. Okay. So backing up to fly me the, the uh, RF4s, RF4. RF4, um, you spent how many years doing that? I was in Vietnam for about seven months because they ended up with too many pilots. Months. But what we were basically doing, we were going out and doing what they call pre-strikes. We were yeah. going and taking pictures so that the targeteers could understand maybe where missile sites were or uh, storage areas or encampments or whatever. And then also probably the more dangerous part was we do post strikes. When the fighters or the bombers got through dropping their weapons, once the dust had settled, that was typically 15 to 20 minutes afterwards, we'd come through and we're on, we don't have any armament. We're, we're just camera people. And we would take pictures so they could document how much damage had been done. How nerve-wracking is that going in? Could be very nerve-wracking when you're going up over the north because they knew you were coming. Yes. Because that was the source that they knew was going to be able to collect the information on how much damage had been done by the fighters that had just left. And you, Cy, do you know anybody who who lost uh, a plane? Oh, quite a few. Yeah. We lost 80-some RF-4s in Vietnam. Matter of fact, um, when I came into the theater, I had to go through a special course because um, not only had a number of, uh, quite a few people have been killed, but quite a few of them had become prisoners of war. Wow. And what they were preparing me for, that if I became a prisoner, that I would have a better idea on maybe where some of the encampments were and some of the ways to deal with the North Vietnamese. What did they tell you? How did they prepare you for possibly being a POW? They kind of gave me an idea on what interrogations might look like. And um, we also had a coding system. It's a, a block five by five. It's done with taps. So you start A, B, A, B, C, D, E, and then you keep going along. And so the tap code is uh, when you want to spell like tapping a pipe or a wall, your first tap is the line. It's the top line. The second tap, you go. So the letter you start your word with is C. And guys got so good at it, they could almost just like Morse code, go tapping through and talk to each other using the tap code. Wow. So you had to learn that language. And what interrogation techniques would you be briefed on that you would that would prepare you for? They kind of gave you an idea that uh, some of the, I mean, they didn't torture you, yeah. but they gave you an idea of some of the things that were, that we knew were occurring. Um, you know, you just hoped it didn't happen to you. In my case, fortunately it didn't. I never really had a, a near miss with a, uh, I saw missiles fired at flights that I was in. Uh, if a missile comes at you 
Alexander. And you're looking out of the canopy. I know it's kind of hard to see down there that all of a sudden this missile is coming along the side of the canopy. That we're in trouble is when you look and you see this like, like a flaming telephone pole and it stays in one position on your canopy. That means it's coming to you. So then you're, hopefully your defensive systems could kick in. But back then our defensive systems were fairly primitive. Then they'd get to a certain point, then you'd try to break quickly, break hard, you know, five to seven Gs and figuring that the missile, because it had smaller fins and was going a lot faster, wouldn't be able to make the turn. So what evasive, that's like an example, I think of an evasive maneuver you're taught to evade missiles. How often do you practice things like that, evasive maneuvers uh, to evade other fighter pilots or missiles? Well, that was part of your training. Now, when obviously, when you get into combat, you were flying things on a daily basis. But back wherever you were stationed back in the United States or like in a, my case later on in Okinawa flying RF-4s, we would have what we called dissimilar training and we'd practice against each other doing these breaks uh, and uh, evaluate okay that you did pretty well on that or you didn't do it hard enough you really didn't move yourself away from where the missile would have been how frequently did you do that like had dozens um, hundreds of times on a, six month, on a six month basis you probably one week in that six month you would probably have three or four or maybe five flights that you would practice those kind of maneuvers. Do you think that's sufficient or enough? Well, once you've been introduced to it, it was probably enough because after you've done it for a little bit, it becomes a refresher. Got it. So during the Vietnam War, um, those seven months, can you, I've heard this once before, but I want to get into detail about it, your most memorable mission in the Vietnam War. Well, this is going to surprise you. Okay. I wouldn't. Initially, I was flying out of Saigon. They closed the unit there, and the same colonel that would later help me get into the SR program, he took me and three other pilots with him up to northern Thailand, to an air base called Udorn. So I was flying uh, night missions out of there because we've been flying night missions, and I'm flying day missions. And this one particular day, I came in, and they said, you have to go see the, the uh, operations officer. You have a very special mission today. So the navigator with me, I came over to uh, Hanoi or something like that where we go in and uh, the ops officer tells us to sit down and said, the United Nations Command has made a special request to the, to the United States. There are two French archaeological teams in Angkor Wat and they're coming under attack from the Khmer Rouge, which were the communists in Cambodia. Your mission today, and if you can do it today, but you may have to do some of it tomorrow, we want you to photo map all of Angkor Wat. Wow. And Angkor Wat is a big city, and we're flying it at 2,000 feet, quarter mile lines, and Alexander, it was spectacular. You'd see the jungle and all of a sudden there'd be this temple sticking up through the jungle or there was an area that had been cleared. It was a, um, a most memorable mission for us. I haven't heard that. So you'd, at this point in your life, you've probably never seen anything like this, right? I had never seen that. You're exactly right. And how, when you're looking at the plane in the RF, like, can you take it in or do you have to really focus? Like, can you really like look around and like take it in and be like, wow. If you keep the airplane steady, it was easier to do it in the RF4 than the SR. Yeah. Cause the SR needed a lot more uh, tending to, but with the RF, you know, where the turn was critical to make sure we lined ourselves up. We knew how to, we figured out how to do that, but then you're going to fly a straight line for, you know, four or five minutes. So during that time you're flying a straight line, you can keep the airplane level and you can look out in either direction and go enjoy what you see down there. How long I'd love to go back sometime and actually visit yeah, Anchor on, Wat. I don't know friends. if I ever will, but uh, I've had friends that have visited and said it's absolutely spectacular. 
Wow, you should definitely do that then. That would that's what a what a moment that would be. How long did it take you to uh, photograph the entire city? Um, we spent about two hours, and then uh, had to go to a tanker. Yeah, and uh, refueled, came back, and I can't remember if I had to land and get more film uh, because. Uh, Anchor Watt, as I recall, was about 60 miles by 60 miles, all these different kinds of buildings. I mean, it wasn't always, there were parts that were very heavily developed and other parts that were more sparsely. And there was parts that you couldn't see what was there because it's all jungle. Because mm. nobody's lived there for, I don't know, 400, 500 years, something like that. Wow. So you're seeing like land that almost nobody has seen before. That's very That's right. special. I, I mean, now we have more tours that go there. But yeah. think about it back there. This is 1971. Not a lot of people had been to Angkor Wat. What's, I want to go back and circle back to Vietnam, but what was the most spectacular thing you saw uh, from a plane any time in your life? Well, northern Thailand, I saw herds of elephants that were, you know, they, they just lived there. Um One of the most memorable nights, and it wasn't a combat. Where I was coming back from combat. I'd been flying a, a night mission up over the southern part of North Vietnam. And I can't remember the name of the festival, but the ties in this time of year, it's November. And everybody in the villages makes a little boat and they put a uh, candle in it. Yes. And then they float it in the village or in the river. And as we came back that night, I can't tell you how spectacular it was wow. to see all these candle lights of all these little villages that we were passing over as we were heading back to our base to recover. I mean, I almost wanted to stay up in the air longer because the two of us were just, I mean, it was, it, it was inspirational wow. to see this type of thing. And that's when we learned about this uh, family festival type of a thing that takes place once a year in November. Yeah, uh, I just looked it up. Loi, Loi Kratong, something like that. Um, did, that. It humanizes and brings a real connection to the lands that and the people that essentially you're fighting against, right? I mean, well, then, go ahead. Of course, we weren't fighting against the ties, and I love the ties. Oh, they, sorry, that's true. My bad. But uh, you know, and when I was in Vietnam, flying out of Saigon, you almost felt sorry. I've told people for the Vietnamese people because you know, starting with World War II, when the Japanese invaded, then you had you know the conflict afterwards. So you start about 1940, and here we are in the 70s. And that's all these people have known. Mm. What do you make of that? Like, like, well, it, it changes the whole culture. You know, you think about it that, uh, um, I mean, the French had been there since what, somewhere in the 1800s when uh, Vietnam, Indochina was a French colony. And then you have uh, the Japanese take it over World War II. Um, and then the North Vietnamese are trying to, unite the country. The French come back uh, or have not left. They're trying to keep it as a colony. And then the American presence. So um, it's kind of interesting now that we're doing so much with the, uh, the Vietnamese. Now? Well, what's, what's, uh, I'm not familiar. What are we doing now? Uh, look at all the industry. They've moved factories and everything else and, oh, okay. you know, the standard of living and, and there's a lot of uh, tourism. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Vietnamese base, uh, beaches, Alexander, are absolutely beautiful. I, I was never at one, but I flew over many of them. You saw and you have these beaches. lovely, long, sandy beaches and this azure blue ocean mm -hmm. coming up against it. You know, we always used to say, you know, someday there's going to be a bunch of resorts around here because the, the settings were so pretty. And you're right. Uh, when you look back on the Vietnam War, hindsight is always 2020, right? But when you reflect back on the Vietnam War and the U.S. involvement in it, how do you think it was handled as a whole? Like, 
what what could you what could we as people and you as an American learn from it? Well, you know, you can always second guess when you're looking looking in reverse. Of course. A couple of my observations would be Ho Chi Minh actually wrote because I've seen the letter in our national archives, a letter to Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States, as they went to the uh, peace treaty of World War I, begging the president to basically free Vietnam from the French as a colony. Do not maintain, you know, let us have our independence. Uh, he was in Paris, he was, uh, he was already a, a communist. Um, of course, we didn't do that. Then you have the whole rolling thing with the 1917. My background is Russia and the, the communist revolution, uh, what I studied extensively in college. You have the communism, the terrible revolution that took place in Russia. You've got to trying to expand. You have World War II. Coming out of World War II, you have all the Eastern satellites are now under Russian communist rule. And there's a real feeling that communism is gonna overrun France and Italy. And then China falls, you know, uh, they have to evacuate the nationalist party, end up on Taiwan where the, where the re residue is today. And then you have the, the French Indonesian war story. And it was this kind of mindset that the whole the whole world was coming apart. If we don't do something, communism was going to run over everything. Mm. Hindsight, not agreeing with the, the type of government, but in some ways, Ho Chi Minh was a founding father. And the communism that has evolved there, um, it's not the kind of way that we might want to do it, but in a sense, the, the people are better off. They, they do have peace. Um, it, it might not have been exactly necessary. And the way the war was fought was also very, it was fought by the politicians in Washington, D.C., and they they did many things we're finding out about now that they had this gradualism idea. If you can imagine, not so much for we, the RF4s, but for the fighters, because we were involved, they thought if they just, slowly increase the pressure, but they'd also many times tell the North Vietnamese where the fighters were coming the next day. You know, we wondered why we had such losses because the North Vietnamese kind of knew where we were coming from. And you, and you compare that to what happened in Desert Storm and basically the militaries that were to put Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait and push him back, it wasn't a gradualism. It was, let's use the best of our allied forces, I think there were 28 different countries, British, French, ourselves, um, many others, brought it to a short, fairly quick uh, ending um, to restore the Kuwait and go on. I think had they turned the military uh, and started the bombing earlier and some of the other stuff, the North Vietnamese would have sued for peace. Now in the long term, there still may have been some kind of a reunification. I was lucky enough with my family to be living in West Germany when the wall came down. What Matter of fact, my like? wife and I were in Berlin on bi official business the weekend before the wall came down. And um, Sunday night before we came back, back to West Germany, we had dinner in East Berlin. And um, that the day before, um, over a million East German citizens had booed their communist party off the platform in the middle of uh, East Berlin because they were so dissatisfied with the government uh, per se. So that night there was uh, my boss, a general officer and uh, three other colonels and their wives were on the east side of Brandenburg Gate looking to the west and saying, you know, I don't know when, but change is coming. And we were so... You I really was in Washington. Said that. Huh? You really we said, said that. that? Yeah. Huh. What could you feel before you continue the story? What, what could you feel to make you say that? Well, there had been a huge rally the day before that okay. had booed the Communist Party off the platform. Course, we were yeah. not allowed to go over on Saturday. Okay. And when you came in on Sunday, 
it was like, if you ever read the book, 1984, everything was clean. I mean, like nothing had ever happened. And we were being followed by their secret police because we were in uniform. They knew we were there. How did you know you were um, being followed? Oh, yeah, we knew we were being followed, particularly since we were all in uniform and my general my general had two stars on his shoulder and you got four colonels with eagles on their shoulders. So was it that obvious you could you could say or you had to oh, be we were in uniform? Yeah. The the agreement coming out of World War Two. Yeah. In the in the uh, administration of Berlin, overall Berlin, that if you're British, French or or U.S., you could go visit East Berlin when you wanted to. But you had to be in your military uniform. Okay. The same thing, the Soviet soldiers, mostly officers, could come to West Berlin and visit as long as they were in their uniforms. So it was a when when we were over in East Berlin, we were in our uniforms. So that we weren't hiding anything from them. But you could kind of feel the tension just from what had happened the day before. We couldn't have predicted that three days later the wall would be peacefully breached. And what was so wonderful is to be in Germany at that time, and of all the things we expected, we never expected it to be peaceful. And when the East Germans decided they were not going to kill West Germans, and then you start the whole domino effect because pretty soon you've got Czechoslovakia, you've got Romania, you've got Bulgaria, and their communist regimes, you know, falling because of what has taken place in basically Berlin, Hungary. Why, why do you think it did end up peacefully? And why did you think and suspect that it wasn't going to end up peacefully? Because of what had happened in Czechoslovakia in, uh, what was it, 1976, what happened in Hungary in 1956, because you had large Soviet forces stationed in East, East Germany. And nobody had any idea, would the, would the Soviet forces be allayed against the East German people uh, or West Germans if they tried to breach the wall? Uh, that was an unknown. And, and from everything I've read and understand, Gorbachev had a lot to do with that, of not doing, basically telling East Germany, we are not going to use our forces to uh, maintain order in your country. Mm. Interesting. And so you guys have the dinner. And then were you still there when the, when the wall came down? No. Um, early Monday morning, we got on the uh, – it was a special troop train that runs once a day at that time period. And so we took the tr troop train back. And then Tuesday morning, I flew to Washington, D.C. I used to have to go to Washington, D.C. every other week uh, for uh, budget meetings, for uh, arms uh, negotiations. I was involved with the reducing of the conventional arms, my team. Um, we also, when we took the nuclear um, cruise missiles, basically they were launched from mobile trucks. They're called the ground launch cruise missiles that we had based in um, Holland, Germany, England. We hadn't gotten the bases yet done in, in Italy. But when we signed an agreement with the uh, Russians, it, the whole thing was to force the Russians to take their tactical nuclear weapons out. Uh, so once that treaty was made, then the, t the team that uh, worked for me helped with the inspections. So the Russians would come and inspect our sites that had been shut down. Um, you had to either destroy the missiles. We cut them up. The Russians fired them. So we had teams in Poland watching them fire and say, okay, they fired three missiles today. And what so was we this had, agreement called? It was the uh, ground. Oh, shoot. Was it a denuclearization denuclearization yes. deal? Denuclearization of the uh, the rockets and the cruise missiles on both sides of the Iron Curtain at that point, out now, of East Germany and out of uh, the NATO, the short range ones. How much trust 
do you have at the time that both sides aren't hiding something else and they're only superficially getting rid of a small portion? There's a there's a saying that the U2s had that the SRs also had, trust but verify. Hmm. So we always suspected the Russians would be up to something, but they actually got quite a bit out of it. Um, they had they ended up well, of course, then the reunification comes about uh, with uh, East and West Germany, which really had large impacts because then the Soviet forces. Their, their larger Soviet forces had to move back to uh, the Soviet Union, per se. And they were so short on housing. The One of the agreements that the West German government uh, agreed to as part of the reunification, that they were going to build 100,000 apartments in Russia for them. I mean, you're looking at a country that if you I've been there. I've taken my youngest daughter in her class as an escort. I got special permission to go with my wife to be uh, escorts for them. But you have a nuclear arm, a high-end military in many areas, but it's a third world country. When you look at the economy, you look in the cities, um, you know, you go into, I took the kids into a grocery store. I said, take a look. This is what they're waiting in line for. And you couldn't recognize the meat. It was just a stack of meat sitting on the table. Wait, wait, wait. Where are you right now? In Moscow. Really? Yeah. In, in what, uh, what year? This is uh, 1991. Wow, that's not that long ago. No. What do you think? It, there, were long, there were longer lines for vodka than there were for some <laughs> of the other stuff. Do you know what it's like now, 30 years later? I think it's somewhat better. But it's only somewhat. Only somewhat. What? Really? You know, that's why when people talk about communism, I get so up in arms about it because I know the suffering. And uh, uh, and they've had dealt with inflation. Um, you know, they had tried to go with democracy for a little while. But, you know, my background's in Russia, uh, the Russian history and everything. When you don't have a background, I mean, you and I were lucky enough to to be born and raised in countries that had a background that democracy of one form or another was part of our life. Absolutely. All that the Russian knows is they had czars all the way up, very autocratic czars up to 1917. And then equally autocratic comes the Communist Party. They, they've really never been a free... Uh, you know, had a had a voice that they were going to make decisions. One of the interesting things when East and West Germany um, united, I was the what they call the base commander at Ramstein Air Base in in West Germany near Kaiserslautern. It's the largest U.S. Air Force base in Europe. I had five thousand people working for me, including a thousand Germans, and we supported. I was like the mayor. We had sixty five thousand Americans there with the families and everything. And we started getting East Germans when they came together and they would bring East Germans to West Germany and try to teach them about how do you manage how, you know, a small business or how do you do this and that. And Alexander, one of the biggest problems that the we found with the East Germans, they've been communists for 47 years. So their culture, even though they were common Germans, spoke German language, but the, they'd kind of diverged on the cultural side. You take them into a store, and then they look at you with a puzzled look like, um, why do you have so many different kinds of toothpaste? Huh. Uh, why why are, are there five different kinds of soap? Wow. I mean, they went into a store, and there was toothpaste. There was soap. There was, there was no decision. It's like, this and, is what and, you will get. There is one option. There is a... Yeah. You, and you hope they have it, you know? It was... You didn't have choices. You just hoped they had it. Yeah. And like, like the butchers in the village that we lived in for a while, that the East German butchers were good butchers, but they were accustomed to a, a lifestyle that by noon every day they ran out of meat to cut. And so now you're in West Germany. He said, no, wait a minute. Hey, we got work to do. 
what do you mean we got work to do? It's it's noon. Aren't, aren't we through? No, we're not through. Uh, all kinds of things came out that that uh, made for an interesting uh, interesting time to be living in Germany. That's I want to talk about that more. Um, because to give context, you did your major of international affairs in Russia, um, and when you reflect back on all the history you've studied through the communist Russian revolution, what do you think we can learn from that? We can learn that uh, people kept under very, you know, autocratic conditions at some point there's going to be a change and typically it's going to come about through violence. And oftentimes the change that they come to ends up being not any better than what they had. Because it's one thing to lead a revolution and to overthrow a government. It's another whole thing to try to create a government that actually functions and serves the people. Hmm. That's something to reflect on. How, why, why did your curiosity draw you to Russian affairs? Well, you know, you talked about the Cold War. Mm. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay. Um, you know, we used to, growing up, it was duck and hide. You know, there's going to be a nuclear exchange and you're in school and you got to hide underneath your desk. You know, I t we tell our kids and grandkids and they look at us and said, what are you talking about? I said, no, we used to practice in the 50s that there was going to be an, possibly a, be an attack and the only way we'd survive is in which we probably wouldn't survive, but yeah. the idea was you're going to go hide underneath your desk. All right. And so um, in the San Francisco community, there's quite a white Russian community that escaped during the revolution, uh, either directly to the United States or to South America and then came to the United States. So I got introduced through my dad with some of his friends to some of the Russian culture, and I found it to be quite interesting. Of course, you know, I don't know how broad-based Melbourne is. I imagine you have quite a few different uh, ethnic backgrounds yeah. there. But the San Francisco Bay, you name it, the background is there. I grew up. That's why my wife and I enjoyed living overseas. And uh, she uh, was a treasurer for an international women's group for a number of years. And we traveled around to support it because I just really like to meet people from different cultures and learn about what they think and their values and that. So having uh, done some stuff with the white Russians in the Bay area, I was fascinated by it. I've always been fascinated by history. So it was one of the majors I could do at the air force Academy, believe it or not. And so I pursued it. That's great. That's it's, it's such an important, but nugget. you had to have an engineering degree. Yes. See, Congress. If you're, if you're graduating from any of our service academies, you have to have all the engineering courses, but Naturally. then you can major in an area outside it. So that I majored in uh, the Soviet communist system and their economics and everything. That's an important distinction. Thank you. Uh, and now looking at Russia and looking at its future and it's, it's interplay as a major global power with the rest of the world. What do you see? What do you think? I see Putin who was a fairly minor, a KGB figure when East Germany, when the wall was breached, and then you had the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he's trying to recreate a mini Soviet Union, Russia, and using the assets that he has. Uh, you know, right now he's trying to get, um, oh shoot, I can't remember the, used it used to be one of the satellite countries to get them more aligned, you know, because you have Latvia, uh, Lithuania, and Estonia clearly don't want to have anything to do with Russia. And that's why they are very much relying on NATO to try to, but at least 25% of their population in each one of those countries are uh, Russian speakers because of uh, the years that uh, they were part of the, dominated by the soviet union okay interesting storytelling i i think we could talk about 
the learnings from Russia and the communist revolution for hours, at least let me to hear you speak about it because it's something I'm not knowledgeable on uh, very much. But to backtrack to Vietnam, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, you talked about that one moment um, flying over Vietnam and you saw those temples and that was very memorable. But what was it like? You did bring wounded army soldiers back. How did that work? Like, how did you actually transport and pick them up? And what did you see and feel during those missions? That was when I was flying worldwide in transports. The 141 could be reconfigured into a flying hospital. So we would fly with a hospital configuration and we would go into one of the major in the north part of South Vietnam would be into Da Nang. We could go into Cameron Bay, which was in the center of uh, South Vietnam, or we could go into Saigon. Tonsonode Air Base was there. And so they had field hospitals that had prepped these wounded. Sometimes we would fly, we would, and when we brought the wounded on board, doctors and nurses would accompany them. They would be on the airplane with us. I never flew into the hospital in the Philippines, but the major air base there, Clark, was a place where they'd pray, uh, take some of the uh, wounded to. The ones I did uh, was involved with were ones we were flying back to the United States. And basically what you'd do, you'd leave Vietnam. You would then fly up typically and land in Japan. Another crew, you'd be on the ground as short a time period as you could. An another crew would jump on the airplane once it had been refueled. And from there would fly up to Alaska. And then Alaska, you'd change crews again. And then from there, you'd fly down into the lower 48, as we call it, the 48 states. And a hospital area had already been selected. It could be on the West Coast, like Travis Hospital. It could be an Army hospital, wherever they wanted to take them to. And it was truly amazing because you were saving these men's lives. Occasionally, there'd be a nurse or someone that had also been injured. Uh, I remember one conversation one night. Um, up over the North Pacific. And the uh, fellow, the doctor I'm talking to is a neurosurgeon. And I said, what brought you into the service? He said, well, I was in a hospital in uh, Chicago. I think he was probably getting a pretty big pay. And he said, because of some of the injured I had seen in that, I volunteered to come in the military. And uh, for, I think it was going to be for three years. And he's and I said, well, what do you think on your personal thing? He said, he said, I can't put a price on this. He said, I have seen more trauma and I've learned more in the year and a half I've been in the military. And it has taught me so much that when I return back to, to civilian life, I will be a much more capable doctor. Mm. And I just thought it was an interesting perspective. Um Basically, in, in Vietnam, we had a, a thing. If you could get um, a wounded soldier out of the field within 45, uh, within 30 minutes to a field hospital, that's not one of the main areas, but a field hospital, you had about an 85% chance of saving that person. In Iraq, during Desert Storm, that was now 45 minutes because of our advanced military, uh, advanced medical technology we had, and the survival number was 93. But you're seeing entirely different type of injuries because of the IEDs yeah, and things like yeah. that. You have a lot more brain trauma. But, you know, out of the sadness comes uh, goodness also, because we have learned so much about um, artificial limbs, I watched the demonstration. It was a film, but it was to it was to us in the Intel community, um, where they had taken this uh, sergeant who had lost an arm to an IED. They had mapped his brain, if you can imagine, and then figured out where they needed to put the the nodes that they needed to do. And then the the problem was how to strap it to his shoulder. But he got to the point. If you can imagine, he could control his fingers. He could rotate his hands of this artificial 
by his brain. It's amazing. It wasn't a mechanical thing than in the past. And you know, you you look at it, how many people every year going about what they're doing suffer some kind of a, a spinal injury that causes them to be paralyzed and uh, all these other things that now it's tragic that it was developed in a war situation, but it's positive that the fact that you now have this technology that you can apply to a broader part of the, uh, of your population. Absolutely. And um, I know, I don't, I know you're, you know, you're familiar with Elon Musk, but I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, what he's creating with Neuralink. Have you heard of that? So that is a, I just sent a, a, a an invitation to Elon Musk to be our guest speaker next June at our SR 71 gathering. But, uh, his staff came back and said he really appreciates the uh, offer, but he's going to be extremely busy. And, and what led up to this, and I'm sure you didn't see it, his wife or whatever, I think she's his wife, they had a boy yeah. in May. And they named it the alpha, the Greek letters for artificial intelligence. And then the last part of the name was A12, which is the predis the single seat predecessor to the SR. It looks just like it. Is it flown by a single pilot? Oh. And in a, in a new one of the news people says, What's what's with his name? You know, this is so strange. And so he said, Well, I'm into artificial intelligence, and growing up as a kid. The A-12 Blackbird was so inspirational to me that that was my all-time favorite airplane forever. Wow. So I hear this and I go, oh, this sounds like a guy we ought to invite. Yeah. So I invited he and his whole family to come spend a couple of days with us and get to know the people that help build, maintain, and fly those airplanes that he professed to be so in love with. So uh, Keep, look. If there's one of the busiest humans on the planet, he's probably one of them. But Buzz, keep trying, keep trying. Well, I, I don't take no for an answer. <laughs> it's called a reengagement. Reengagement. There you go. Um, well, okay. The, the interesting thing to back up about um, Vietnam was you had 30 minutes, basically, to maximize the 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 health and life of these servicemen and women. How does that, how do you think about that in your head? Are you hitting a timer, like a stopwatch as soon as you fly off? Are you like, you trying to fly as fast as possible? Like, what can you do? That was really for the army. Yeah. Although there was some air force helicopters that might've been involved. This is really for ground forces. Cause you figure if you bailed out of an airplane, one, they got to find out where are you? And to get help to you, you hope that this, the injuries really aren't aren't too severe. I mean, um, I had one of my navigators when we were flying out of Saigon. He ejected twice. Now, he was okay. Um, when he did it the second time, he wasn't – the first time he kind of thought it was, well, this is interesting because it was a controlled ejection from an airplane that was not landable hmm. that they uh, – Pick the time and place, and there was a helicopter right behind them to pick them up. And the second time, they ended up in Cambodia in the middle of a firefight, and um, it was an entirely different story. Uh, but it was really for the ground forces because the likelihood, if you're flying an airplane, that they could get somebody to you, unless you crashed. Let's say you crashed on landing. It's very much applicable to you. Get get the wounded people out of the airplane and get them to medical and then move them on. You know, of course, with airplanes and things like that, your big concern is burns. I mean, burns are absolutely terrible. Did you uh, see, I don't, I'm not sure how like, uh, how much time you spent, you know, in the cockpit of the plane versus helping physically outside of the plane. Did you see that visually, physically much in people? Um, I mean, I witnessed a couple crashes and trying to get to the, uh, airplane as quickly as they could. And, and if people hopefully, uh, 
I've seen a crash where everybody walked away from it. You know, that's your perfect, if there is a perfect crash. And I've seen crashes where uh, the fire department would put down the flames and were trying to get people out uh, before they became seriously burned and with their, in, including their injuries that were pre- preventing them from getting out. So um, it's a, it's a mixture. Absolutely. Okay. So I want to now shift to Desert Storm. Okay. okay. You were a wing commander during the Gulf War at R- Ramstein Air Base in Germany during Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Right. When, what year was that? And when you reflect back on that, do you have some memorable stories and just general feelings about that time? That was, it was from 1990 into 1991, uh, Desert Shield, because the invasion took place in uh, late July when the uh, Iraqis invaded uh, Kuwait. Yeah. And then, of course, the uh, air operations started in January of 91, and then the invasion well, about a month later, I think. Um, I was in a support role. Uh, cargo airplanes were coming through December of uh, 1990. Uh, about 90,000 Army troops departed from Ramstein Air Base. So we were supporting them, getting them on their, the uh transports that were going to take them down to Saudi Arabia to get them into position. I had 800 of my 5,000 people down working for different parts down in the theater. They were in uh, Saudi Arabia. Some of them were in Turkey, but they were forward deployed per se, because we had to stay. We were like an air bridge. So we had constant flow of, of, of uh, uh, transport aircraft coming through, carrying supplies uh, for the Middle East. And then we were also doing prep work, uh, working with the French and our allies that were going to go down and participate in Desert, Stor- uh, Desert Storm to try to give them some idea. Because in what had been formerly East Germany, there were some uh, sites set up that were uh, replicated Soviet missile systems that the Iraqis had so they could practice flying against them and understanding maybe what they needed to do and did they have adequate protection. Did you volunteer? It was a very busy time. Did you volunteer for that? Uh, (laughs) I was a commander. There was no choice. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, that makes complete sense. Um, What were you transporting? They They were transporting all kinds of supplies, um, munitions typically would come by ship, but we did have munitions that were being shipped out. Uh, again, it was troops. It was the, the food and supplies and stuff that they would need because you were bivouacking them down in the desert. Like I said, we moved the vast majority of them down in, De- in December because from July up until December, the major part of the operations was air operations. And then you went into the heavy, and then of course the invasion took place. And then of course you have Egyptian, you got all these other forces that were joining you in Saudi Arabia that would uh, be part of the coalition that would carry out the war. How do you, go ahead. And part of our function, because the intelligence gathering and analysis at headquarters in, in Europe both uh, NATO and, and ourselves were supplying information that would be going down to our combined forces down there. Okay. How do you manage all those hundreds of people as, a, as the commander, I believe you say commander, um, how do you manage all those hundreds of people and, and the personnel? And what does that teach you about leadership? It teach you, teach you a lot about leadership because – Basically, it's all about people. Yeah. You know, if if you try to be too nem- demanding from above, I mean, what I mean by demanding, what we call uh, nitnoi. You're so you're telling them, I want you to go to A to B to C to D, and you and you ignore people on their initiatives that they could possibly help you do it more effectively. Right. So you need to set 
What's the goal? What do we need to accomplish? Like how many airplanes a day do we need to service and get through here in December? How do we package lunches for 90,000 army troops? Because the kitchens work for me on the base because the army didn't come with kitchens. You know, how do you do this flow? And what I did, I had five colonels that worked for me. Not in the, You understand, I retired as a colonel. So I have colonels working for me. And they had large segments that they were directly responsible for. Then they had commanders below them that had smaller sections. So communications was at a premium so that we all, everybody understood what needed to be done but it wasn't me going down and doing that specific thing. They knew the part that was their responsibility and that they knew that if they had a problem, my door, my ears were always open to try to overcome whatever problem they had if they couldn't, if they couldn't deal with it. Okay, so when those problems did arise, when you had to come into contact with conflict, how, how did you best problem solve those conflicts and communicate them? It depended on, was this a conflict in our own organization where two people had very different ideas and I would be the, I could be the mediator to come with a compromise or I could be the decision maker and say, okay, we're gonna do it that way. If it was something external to us, then it was up to me. Like I'll tell you, uh, this army two-star, or was he a three-star? Anyway, he was clearly outranked me by quite a bit. He wanted to bring his soldiers and set up a camp at Ramstein Air Base. And I said, respectfully, sir, no, I will not permit it. And he says, Colonel, you can't do that. I said, yes, sir, I can. Because your people are going down into combat. You need to keep them on your base and with their families as long as you can. I do not want to see any soldier on this base until it's within four hours of when they're going to get on an airplane. We are not going to run. <laughs> and he said, that is unacceptable. So what did I do? I picked up the phone. I called the four-star commander for the Air Forces in Europe. And I said, sir, I have a problem. This is what the Army wants to do. And he goes, you got to be kidding me. I said, no, they got it in their mind. They want to set up. He said, they're not. He said, don't worry, Buzz, I'll take care of it. So that was an example of how the problem went away. <laughs> you uh, you got a four star to overrule the two or three star. So, That's uh, exactly right. But uh, you know what's interesting? You took that risk because maybe maybe their four star, he, he wouldn't have agreed maybe, but you were, were confident and assertive enough where you weren't going to back down just in the face of someone with a higher authority to you? Well, in some ways, you know what your responsibility, yeah. that we were preparing for a war. Yeah. If I had to put my, if my career at risk, then so be it. I was going to put my career. I knew what needed to be done. Right. And that's what I've always been outspoken. I mean, not, I don't attack people, but I, I don't shy away from saying, you know, I think there might be a better way or, or do we really want to do the, do this uh, and let the cards fall where they may. Um, that's kind of when they make you a leader, uh, many times the decisions aren't easy and the decisions you render you could be held accountable accountable for at some future time or almost immediately. Have you it ever just, been in situations in your career where you had to make like career defining decisions? Like, do you have those moments? Uh, yeah, I have a couple. I got into a conflict with the White House when I was in the Pentagon, but I, I really can't go into, uh, and they threatened me. Really? Um, for a couple of years, Alexander, my job in the Pentagon was funding all the super classified programs for the Air Force. Yeah, so you were a black world programmer, right? I was a black world programmer. And what that means is people that supported me because they were the individual program managers, 
they would bring me the information. I would then brief at typically at the one star brigadier general level. I would then brief at the two star level, the major generals. And then once or twice a year, I would brief at the four star level to the very senior leaders in the Air Force as how we were, how these programs were advancing, how the monies, what we had programmed, how they're being expended. And then twice a year or so with a technical expert, he and I would go up to Congress and brief only the key members who were cleared for what we were doing. But they had to approve the budget per se. And this was a case where um, there were some things that were happening that were not right and we were not aware of it. Um, it was a it was a kind of a thing that um, had we been aware of it and realized who had made the decision at the president's level that we would more than heartedly support it. That's what we were about. But it it uh, had all the appearances of some illegal activity, and they threatened me. And I said, I'm going to the head of the Air Force, the four star, and because I'm seeing where you're taking money, and that's Air Force money, unless you tell me what it's for. Well, they backed down. Really? And they really? they eventually briefed the four star and the secretary of the Air Force because I said that's what you, you I said you're spending their money. It may be very important, which it was, yeah. but you have to show us that it's you know this is a legitimate use of the taxpayers' money and fully uh, within the level of the law. Do you suspect they were putting it into their own pockets? No, no, okay. have nothing to do. It, it had to do with President Reagan's vision of how do we better prepare the country in case something in the Cold War, there was a, a nuclear exchange. Huh. Now, I, how, do we, how do we try as best we can to make our democracy survivable? Right. So it's a, that's such a tough decision, right? Because that, so what I'm understanding is they took from the Air Force budget um, to put into a nuclear exchange to give them a advantage in the Cold War? It was War. actually, was, it was for, if you, it had nothing to do with the nuclear part of it. Okay. It had to do, how do you shelter the senior leadership in the United States, including the Congress and other key members, so that out of it, you hopefully might be able to survive and support whatever remains of the country after some kind of an exchange might have taken place. Oh, oh, oh okay. But that's very important, obviously, right? But yes. so they didn't have like built nuclear bunkers yet? No, they had them, but they were trying to modernize them and they were trying to make them much to have a plan. Oh, okay. Because we had the bunkers, but it was what I would call ad hoc. Oh, I, we need to do something. No, yeah. there's a plan. And matter of fact, later on, when 9-11 took place, and I'm observing it, I'm in my brain, because I'm telling, I'm not, <laughs> even though I'm in a group that's, it was a very classified briefing, I, in my brain, I said, okay, this is what the president is going to do now. This is where he's going, because this is where we put stuff. This is how he could communicate to the nation. This is, you know, this is what these different people are going to be doing. President Reagan wanted an organized plan that if something should happen, yeah. that people knew what they were supposed to do. As a, well, as a government official, not a nation. No, as a government official supporting a national objective. Now, that's the... Quote, potentially the illegal activity that, yeah, that you may have seen because they were taking the funds away, even though the intention maybe is you could um, respect, right? But how they were going about it was, was not ethical. That's right. Because when you're taking money that comes from the taxpayers, there needed to be a, a trail of decisions that you saw that, that rendered that this was what needed to, to take place. It wasn't just somebody with some wild idea uh, going off and doing something. 
And now this is a, correct me for a moment, it's a $6 billion budget you were managing, right? That's correct. So you, the, it was obviously large enough, right? In the, large enough number where you thought this, this is a big red flag. Uh, actually, the amount of money they were taking from us was, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like 30 or 35 million. But see, I had complete visibility over okay. all the black money. Got it. And I saw money going somewhere where I approve it, but it had not been approved as far as I knew. And so I couldn't explain why money yeah. was leaving this particular account. And every transaction you had to approve. No, I didn't necessarily have to approve, but I monitored because the approval really came from the general officers. They, when they approved something, there was a whole thing that went with it that said, okay, Got when it. you approve this, these are the things that are going to occur. You and then there was people that, that worked for me or supported me. I supported them that monitored the individual transfers of money um, and things like that as they expended it. I, de I definitely want to kind of get into the more details there, but you mentioned 9-11. Um, where were you when 9-11 occurred? I was on an Air Force base in Ohio listening to a, a classified briefing, a top secret briefing, matter of fact, and they stopped the briefing and they said, we're switching over to a TV screen from external sources and what you're seeing is actual. And they shifted over and the first tower had already been hit and uh, they locked us all down. So none of us could leave the building. This was at about 9.30 in the morning, I think, something like that. Are you Washington? Uh, you know, that was happening in Washington, New York. I'm in Ohio. You're in Ohio, okay. By about uh, three in the afternoon, all of a sudden they come down and they said, okay, we want you out of here. You're to go to your cars and you're to immediately leave the base and not come back. The base is closed. And so I went back to my hotel I had, I had flown there, and of course, my flight out, all the flights were grounded. Mm -hmm. So uh, I drove home with my rental car. <clears throat> you had to make do. Um, you're in this top secret mission that is not related to anything related to Al-Qaeda, the and Middle East. It had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, when that TV screen flips on and you realize what's happening, or maybe you don't realize it, you ever, like, what what is going through your head and everybody in your room? What, what are they thinking and feeling? They can't believe it. You know, everybody in the room had dedicated their lives in different aspects as uh, in the military, civilian contractors, government uh, employees to uh, protect the country and, and do those kind of things. And here we're watching on the television an airplane crash into one of the... Uh, trade buildings. And then, of course, the one that was heading to Washington crash out in the field. Of course, we don't see it, but we are told the one that they knew was coming towards Washington. They still don't know exactly. And the one that hit the Pentagon already, we, we saw the smoke coming out of the Pentagon. But then we knew that other airplane was coming to Washington to either hit the Capitol or hit the White House. Uh, of course, it never got there. So we don't know mm. what it's we don't absolutely know what its intended target was. In two thousand and one, what was your what was your role? What, what what was you what were you working on at the moment? I was a civilian. I was uh, I worked for a defense contractor, and we were working on a new program that uh, helped speed information um, from different sensors to the decision makers. You know, if you reflect back, when I flew that mission into the Middle East for President Carter. He probably waited 24 to 36 hours or maybe more to get that information. Alexander, we live in a world today that's measured in minutes. Yeah. So we were, we were working a program that could test when we knew something was going on, that the decision makers was very high priority. It knew where the different sensors were. It would task them to do a collection, whatever that collection was, and then deliver it to where the decision makers were. It and was, you could do it. 
Sorry, Buzz. Go ahead. You could do it what? And you could do it 10 times faster than any capability we had at that point. And it was 10 times more accurate because all these sensors collected at the same time. And so you had so much more information and it was tied to what was most important because the decision makers had told you what they were really interested in. And that's what you were looking for. Now, this technology, is it readily available now and known? It's known and it's a part of the core of the United States intelligence and gathering and, and targeting system. Now, and it's the way aircrafts communicate to the ground? Well, it's aircraft, it's satellites. Got it. It's uh, ground sensors. It's, there's a variety of things that can feed information in. And it's all done through uh, basically internet technology. Yeah. And uh, created a message uh, format that uh, is able to go into these different systems and you don't have to do a major modification of let's say an airplane that has let's say 7 million lines of code. You know how much it costs and how much time it takes and all the problems you have. Just think, I'm sure in that where you're talking to me from right now, because it, it's where I'm talking from you to you here, I've got a smartphone and anytime I want a new capability, I download an app. Mm. This was one of the first uses of an app for defense purposes. Wow. So we were able to put an app on an airplane that translated the question we asked into the format of the airplane, how it operated its system. And so when it collected the information, it came back out through the app and put it in the format we wanted to be delivered to where it needed to go. That's unclassified. The way it works, yeah. what's classified is when you put numbers in it. But the way the process works is not classified. So that's what that meeting you call quote that was, Well, that was part of what the meeting was about because they were trying to look at some new, they wanted us to try to develop some new capabilities, bring in sensors we hadn't used before. Got it. Do you get concerned about how reliant we are on technology, the internet and electrical um, means because they can be kind of wiped out by things like solar flares, uh, EMPs. Do you think very about much that? so? Very much so. It, it's very fragile. Yes, very good word. Like with this, like thin veneer. We are all like, like of society that can easily become so fractured and tip the other way if just one major event occurs. Well, think about it too, as particularly, I would say more younger people become so dependent on smartphones that if the smartphone goes down, they haven't had the background to say, okay, the internet doesn't work. How can I go about finding this information? Mm -hmm. Because they're so accustomed to taking their iPhone, Googling it or whatever, pulling up the information that they wouldn't know to go to a library and figure out how they could find it or, or go, you know, look at the different alternatives because they become so dependent on, you know, we had a hurricane go through here a few years ago. My wife and I were traveling and uh, they opened up this market. Uh, I can't remember what I wanted to go in for because we were traveling down to Florida. And the irony was they got the market open but they couldn't sell you any food because they had no electricity and the computers didn't work. So they couldn't manage what they were doing. And the gas stations that you needed gas, if they didn't have electricity, the pumps didn't work. Mm. They couldn't sell you any gas. So like you, you were asking about, the whole system can become very fragile. How do you think we can prepare for potential fragility in our society? Well, we need more sources of, of energy so you're not completely dependent on, you know, if the electric grid goes down, you know, some of these forecasts, it would be devastating. Absolutely. People would starve to death yeah. because our whole distribution system is based on today on these computers being able to talk to each other and automatically ordering stuff when you're particular things. And 
I think they just have to look, how do we used to do it? And how do you do backups? So in case you did lose your core electrical system, what other ways could you communicate? Like if you had auxiliary uh, power plants and you talk to each other by sending messages by radio, uh, you know, do workarounds. Matter of fact, uh, they're looking at airplanes now. They're concerned that um, there are bad people that are uh, causing GPS to be erroneous. So how do we go back to the way we used to navigate using, you know, ground radios, TACANs and ADFs and things like that to make sure that somebody isn't putting in bad information into the GPS system that we're depending on? Mm. That's a great point. And to back up a little bit from the potential catastrophe that could occur in the future, um, I wanted to ask, Blackwell program at the Pentagon, how on earth did you get that role? What is the story behind that? I was working in the budget area where we developed the future budgets. And one of the program because when I came out of the SR program, I had a lot of security clearances. Yeah. And um, I was working some classified programs and the fellow who had the job ahead of me left and they were looking for somebody. And my boss, it was a two star, uh, basically said, I would like you to do this. And I told him I was delighted because it was a job I would have very, I very much relished the opportunity to do it. So um, that's, how it, that's how it came about. And I did it for a couple of years and I worked almost not exclusively because I had all the support people like myself rank Lieutenant Colonel. Um, but I worked on a daily basis with all general officers all the way up to the head of the air force and the secretary of the air force. And then also working with other services and other agencies in Washington, DC. So it was really a fascinating time period. As we use the expression, it was like being a kid in a candy shop. With a, with a six uh, billion dollar budget, I can imagine. Right. So, you know, the vehicles you know about that I can talk about, we were building the 117, the stealth fighter. Yep. We were developing the F-22, mm -hmm. the stealth fighter. We were developing the B-2 stealth bomber. And, you know, these are all pretty big programs. What the F twenty two? Uh, I'm not sure which which one I want to go to. Um, the F twenty two is the one that really uh, makes me curious. Uh, you didn't fully develop or finish developing it in your time there, but no, what, not even yeah, because that took a long time. What was the outcome that you guys were trying to achieve with creating all of these different aircrafts? We were trying to get airplanes that could evade Soviet and other systems so you, they couldn't detect it. And when they could detect it, it was so close, they wouldn't be able to react to it. And um, part of the problem with the F-22 was during its development, all of a sudden the Soviet Union went away. And then people started going, well, do we still want to develop this airplane? Um, so you, you ended up with numbers that, uh, very frankly, don't make sense. Yeah. When you only build 21 B2s yeah. and you've spent $32 billion to develop them, it, it, it was foolhardy. The, the F-22, we should have built at least 350 of them and they stopped the production at 187. It's a magnificent airplane. There's nothing else like it in the world, but the numbers are awful small. That's, I mean, it's nothing you could do about it right now in your position, but if there is a, if there's one plane you could fly now, what would it be? Probably the F-22. But, you know, um, and I'm not speaking for you, I'm speaking for me. <laughs> I grew up in a different generation. I've flown the F-22 simulator and a lot of other stuff, um, the F-35 recently what's that like the younger generation is growing up with a computer they're growing up with multitasking 
believe it or not, their brains are developing differently than my brain developed. Yeah. I was a routine, sequential type of, of uh, processing inputs and doing things. Um, that's what the cockpits they created for us. A about uh, 15 years ago, I was with a group trying to design, this was probably about 2010, and we were trying to develop a, a future cockpit for 2025 to 2035. And um, one of the leaders came in, Air Force leaders and looked at the room and said, we got the wrong people in here. You guys are all, you're, pre, you're prior to computers, you've learned to use computers. What we need is people that grew up with computers because they'll do things in a cockpit and they will look for capabilities and develop innovation that you will never think of. And that's part of the challenge that, you know, I'd love to fly the F-22, but I don't know, well, of course, at my age, but if I put myself back in the 30s, even then, it would have been a much more challenging cockpit for me. When I converted an F-4 squadron to F-16s, the idea at the time was we were concerned about who we call Blue Four. That's that young, typically lieutenant or young captain pilot that's in the fourth position of a flight. He's the one, or she nowadays, is going to have the accident. When we converted from F-4s to F-16s, the people that were having the accidents were the majors. The people had been around for 15 years. Wow, that was so used to an airplane yeah. that was analog. Yeah. And now I put them into an airplane that was digital with a oh, side stick. Interesting. That's a really interesting comparison. It's like a changing and shifting of technological generations that actually conflict. You well, look, look at our lives now. Who's driving our lives? It's the 20 and 30 years old that are in the computer and computer software industry. Yeah. Tech industries. The tech yeah. industry. I mean, it's it's in every piece of our life because they grew up with it and they say, well, why can't we? Yeah. That's that's and there's a there's a conflict, there's a friction. And okay, you talked about these planes that you helped budget and create and at least put in the initial plans to create. Um I'm surprised you said the ones you can talk about, it has been about nearly 40-ish years. What were you doing? You don't, obviously, if you can't say, you can't say, but like 40 years ago, Buzz, like what could there possibly be else that you couldn't talk about? There were other programs that uh, Alexander, that will remain classified. <laughs> <laughs> When you hear the word classified, it's it's such an alluring. I let know. Me, well, well, I, let's let me say it like this, Buzz. If we were alone and no cameras, well, maybe actually don't answer that because then if we ever become alone with no cameras, though, let's let's but, not answer that. Uh, you you bring up an interesting point. Like yeah. when I was in the SR program, yeah, the wing commander used to have me brief when we had guests because I was always comfortable. I knew where the edge was. And if somebody asked me something that went into a classified area, I tried to gently move it back to something I could talk about. Sure. And so today, you know, just about everything about the SR-71 is declassified. So it's real easy for me to, to talk tours, and I'm, I'm doing a special presentation on, on uh, Tuesday to a, for a museum up in Seattle by, by Zoom. Um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, the interesting point I made about um – things being classified um, and if we're alone <laughs> oh yep. there were circumstances that and I ha I can't speak on how the Australian government does works its classification but the United States government many times is very compartmented. I mean, 
The CIA did it one way. The NSA did it one way. The Army did it one way. The Air Force, DOD tried, the Department of Defense tried to do it another way. And so sometimes in the State Department, I mean, we, there were all kinds of diff different pieces. Um, sometimes you took a walk in the park. Okay. Even today, I occasionally somebody will ask me, not so much since I've been retired now since 13, but there were times uh, they would, people would, without being overly specific, but would say, okay, what do you think about this? And what they want to do is explore my experience and say, okay, um, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that kind of a thing? Which bridges, when you get to a point where if they had officially tried to come and talk to me, they couldn't do it. Are you talking about maybe reporters or? No, not reporters. Other, other people in government. Like just if you're outdoors out and about in the public or is that no, not friend? just in the public some some place where you were the the two of you were without not with ear, ear earshot of anybody i see and you've had that multiple times through your life yes oh okay i think i'm reading between the lines kind of they're trying to test you no they are trying to figure out where does this fit together? Because uh, I more than once came across and had to kind of elevate it and saying, you know, we're doing the same thing in three different locations. You're spending money for the same thing in three different locations because you don't talk to each other. Okay. So what? So I, kind of, I kind of became a clearinghouse. So what's the agenda for these, like, these officials from different organizations coming to you? Well, they're trying to figure out what to do. You know, they're out there and they think they're the only one doing this. Right. And I kind of go, well, you need to talk to so-and-so. You need to talk to so-and-so because there's three of you doing the same thing. It seems, I think I've heard about that before, like how, like everything is very carpet, cup. Carp the word you use, com compartmented. compartmented. And I heard of that in reference to Area 51 and their associated um, bases or associated like little T organizations. And that when they work on these very highly classified aircraft, for example, they don't allow people to, these scientists and engineers to coalesce and work together because if they put all the pieces together, there would be, like they would know too much almost, but if they can't put all the pieces together, then it's a much harder to solve problems. Well, I'll, t I'll give you an example. Like the 117, America's really first really high-end high stealthy vehicle. The F-22, I think, is even better, but the, the 117. Nighthawk. If, if we had let the knowledge get out, then – people who we would potentially use it against could try to figure out how can I counter this capability? Matter of fact, when we went to release the 117, the individual who signed off that said, okay, we can now acknowledge that it exists. I'm saying acknowledge that it exists was president Reagan. When was that? This was, uh, it was, he finally did it in 19, I want to say 87. I'd left in 85, but I did some of the initial paperwork. And we actually sent out fuzzed up pictures of the 117 to some leading institutions in the United States, Aero Institution and Europe, and then asked the people, what do you think this is? And they thought of Star Wars. They thought it was some kind of a super fast, uh, secret type of uh, plane. Well, it doesn't even go supersonic. It flies at night. It's stealthy. But by protecting exactly what it was about, when Desert Storm comes along, 
The only airplanes that went downtown into Baghdad were the 117s because the Iraqis never saw them. Uh, some of the guys that I knew, matter of fact, they brought some of the Iraqi generals to Ramstein when I was there, we were debriefing them. I try to understand from their perspective what happened in the war. And one of the things that came out was the only way we knew 117s were overhead was buildings started blowing up because we never saw them. Why were they so great at being stealthy and being covert? Because they couldn't see them on radar and they were flown at night. Why couldn't they see them on radar? What was it about the technology? Because the shape of the airplane, and, and you're going to find it ironic, the basic theories on the 117 came from a Russian professor who mm -hmm. developed these algorithms in 1965 and took them to the Soviet Air Force and said, I think I, we can develop an airplane that you're going to have really a hard time seeing on radar. And the Soviets said, ah, we think you're a fool. Wow. We're not interested. And they were so uninterested, Alexander, that they let him publish his findings on an open publication. And so some radar engineers at Lockheed found this document, had it translated, and then took it to DARPA and took it to the Air Force and said, we think there's merit, but we have to have a test program, which was eventually called Have Blue. It was a, not a full scale. And when they flew it and they did radar testing on it, it in fact did exactly what this Soviet professor said it would do. Wow. Very difficult to see on radar. That is... That's really interesting. Um, when you were at the, the Pentagon um, and you were working on these, these planes and these, um, you oversaw the budget of many billions of dollars, did you, I asked you about, we talked about fear and scary moments while flying. Do you have a most intimidating, scary moment during that role? First time I briefed the senior leadership of the Air Force on the black budget at that level, because many of them were just being cleared that day because this thing was so compartmented. And I had 11 four stars, probably 10 three stars, maybe as many two stars and a couple one stars. And I'm a Lieutenant Colonel briefing them. How do you keep it together? It was, it was, you, you asked about the time, the mission in, in England, it was more intimidating that particular day briefing. This, this was a very top of the Air Force leadership, along with the Secretary of the Air Force. Do you, I wonder, do you have any uh, techniques um, that you do use to manage and regulate stress and arousal in those situations, breathing techniques, meditations, things you tell yourself? Uh, study the materials that I'm going to go so I can almost do it from memory, although I won't. Yeah. Um, regular exercise to uh, kind of keep things in somewhat of an order, uh, per se. Uh, doesn't mean sometimes you don't get a little, <laughs> a little tight. Take a few deep breaths, and you know, once you get going, mm -hmm. I, I find that uh, it's it's that initial part starting the thing off, uh, particularly when you know that there's some contentious issues that will probably pop up pretty quickly. And that if you can take care of them, then the rest of it should go pretty easily. You know, my last flight in the Air Force was on, you know, taking a U-2 to 70,000 feet. What was they that asked like? me, oh, uh, it was my sixth flight in the, I had an instructor with me. I was in a two seat one. I never, we were, uh, we were short of flights and I wanted the crew members, the men and women that were flying them operationally to have the flights. But they gave me a choice. They said, you want a, a T-38, which is a, a twin engine Air Force trainer, wonderful airplane. I probably have 500 hours in it. And I said, no, or a U-2. I said, no, I want a U-2. And they thought I was going to just fly around the pattern and do some landings and that. I said, no, no, 
tell the folks down there with the spacesuits, they know my size, prepare a suit. I want to go be full, fully suited up. So my last flight in the Air Force was uh, taking off from our home base and going to 70,000 feet and flying around for a couple hours and coming back and shooting some approaches, touch and go, and then uh, landing. And then, of course, they doused me with champagne. So it was the last flight. And salute and say thank you very much, Air Force, for uh, all the adventures and all the flying I had over 4,500 hours in the uh, 28 years that I was in the Air Force, active active duty Air Force. I'm so glad you told that story. Like when you reflect on that, like what do you think? Like how do you feel? I'm very blessed. I was, I felt very blessed that I was selected even to compete, to come into the SR program, let alone get checked out. And the fact that uh, had my last flight in, in such a remarkable airplane, the U-2 is at the opposite scale. The U-2 on a typical takeoff is probably 800 feet and you're in the air. It's a powered glider. Um, you go to altitude. It's, the nickname for the U-2 is the Dragon Lady. And the, and the genesis of this is that when you take off and when you come back to land, the airplane is a dragon and it'll eat your lunch in a heartbeat. You have to stall it to get it on the ground because it's a bicycle landing gear. So it is a tough airplane. At altitude, on autopilot for the most part, but hand flying it, it's a lady. The SR-71 is the opposite of this. It takes you 4,500 feet about to take off in 20 seconds. It's high speed, but it's controllable. You go to altitude, you are on pins and needles to keep that airplane doing exactly what it's supposed to do, flying at 2,150 miles an hour. The U-2 is flying at 450. It's more manageable. You come back in, yes, you're going to land at 175 miles an hour, but it's very controlled. Where the U-2, you're coming in doing 80 miles an hour, and you got your hands full. What a pl- that's such that's so interesting to to fly such a diverse uh, array of aircrafts. Um, when you reflect back on your career now, I'll ask you again, but differently. What is your proudest moment or moments? Well, of course, the SR. I didn't realize it at the time, Alexander, but it's had a lifelong influence on me because only 85 of us ever flew the SR operational pilots and about 85 navigators. So as I went to different other jobs, all of a sudden people would say, oh, I heard you. Did you fly the SR-71? You know, I, w- I normally don't bring it up, but somehow it gets in the conversation and I continue to try to use it to motivate young men and women in what we call the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math programs to, you know, want to be an astronaut, want to be a teacher, want to be an engineer, want to be those kind of things. Some of the proudest moments were things with uh, helping a wing pass a very major inspection that they'd never had before. And not only did we pass, we got an excellent, which was very unusual for even experienced wings that would go through this. But it was all about working with people and seeing um, some fighter competitions when I had a fighter squadron. And even though our airplanes were not as advanced as some of the others, being able to, able to outperform these people because of being able to instill in my pilots and navigators that they were the best and they could do it. If they had the right mindset when they're going into it, they could overcome you know, a lot of the other obstacles per se. Uh, it's... You know, when I look back at the opportunities I had, I'm, I'm amazed. And when I do counseling, which I still do occasionally, for people coming in the Air Force, particularly students that are interested, I said, don't use my career as a standard. I was very lucky. I worked for some great leaders. I worked for leaders that supported me. I worked for leaders that <laughs> said, go do it. Take a risk. You know, what do you have to lose? That's beautiful. And you tell 
Is that why the, your, the people you've taught have more confidence? Because you tell them a similar thing? Yeah. And I tell the younger ones, uh, when I graduated from the Air Force Academy, I'd already seen the SR at Edwards when I was there for a, I did some temporary work there when I was still a cadet. And SR did a flyby for our graduation and Alexander was spectacular. If you had asked me that day, if I'd ever fly that airplane, I assumed that the people flying those airplanes were always engineers. They were tests, they were that. And I was in international affairs. I was not gonna go into tests. I would have told you unequivocally, I'll never fly that airplane. But eight years later, I'm in that airplane. And so I tell young men and women, dare to dream because you never know the opportunities that'll come to you, but prepare your dreams. You know, find out if this is my dream, how do I accomplish it? And go out and try to figure out how can you do that? Because when opportunity knocks, as you, I'm sure you've seen in your life, Many times it's fleeting. You're either prepared to do it or not. Yeah. And I always like, I left the, the SR program as their youngest instructor pilot. <laughs> How old are you then? I was probably 35, but I was a, I was a major. Yeah. And they said, why are you leaving? This is the greatest job. I said, because I want to go try something else. I want to go to the Pentagon and see if I can excel as an officer doing staff work in the Pentagon. And you did. I did. That's but amazing. many of my contemporaries said, we don't think that's very smart. Well, we sit back here all these decades later, and it seems like it was. It was. It made for a very interesting life. Yeah, you say your life is unusual. Your story and your career is unusual. And um, I, I almost think it's it's because you you kept – well, actually – it sounded like you kept chasing just things you wanted to do, your curiosity. When something didn't serve you anymore, you just kept going. You're exactly right. I, I, you know, I had done it. You know, when I left the SR program, I'd done everything except eject out of the airplane. I said, you know, I really don't need to do that. <laughs> I heard that it, it can have such dramatic impacts on your body. It compresses your spinal column. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. No, that's, I came close. Really? You know, when? RF I came close in an RF4 once and I came close in the SR once. So I did not want to do that. That was not part of my, uh, part of my ideas. What was the, the, the close call? Um, off the coast of China, I got a series of unstarts and the airplane pitched up on me and I pushed the stick all the way forward and it wasn't reacting. And so I told my backseater, I said, John, I said, we got three potatoes one potato, two potatoes. And if by the, when I said the third time, if the nose wasn't at least stopping coming up, we were probably going to have to figure out that we weren't a good, because the airplane, once it pitched up to a certain angle, it was going to break up just because at those high speeds, the wind is coming against the structure in a way that it can't stand those, uh, the forces. Wow. So it stopped. I brought the nose back down. We were already on the way home. So it worked out. I had an incident in an RF-4 in spinning upside down because of a flight control malfunction. The airplane had a failure on something. We came pretty close, but I had an instructor in the back, and I was an instructor, and we were over water, so we could nurse the airplane for quite a while, and we were able to bring it under control and land it. Well, and that's a different story. Ejecting over water, what is the protocol there? Well... Um, you had a kit that you were sitting on. So as you're coming down, you're going to pull the, the handle uh, that releases the kit. And in the kit, there's a life raft. So when you land in the water, you release the parachute because it could drag you under. And then you're tied by a lanyard to that, what they call the survival kit and that um, raft. So you're going to pull the raft over to you and get in it. Wow. and then get on the radio and try to get somebody to come rescue you. And you practice that. You went, every pilot and navigator, you went through water survival. And they would introduce you to these life rafts and how to get in and how to use the emergency radios to try to call somebody. They gave us mirrors. So if you, the radio didn't work, let's say an airplane's out there looking for you, you take the mirror 
and you try to get the sun to, you know, flash the sunlight against the cockpit of the airplane to tell them, hey, I'm down here. Come get me. Has that ever worked? Is there a story of that? Yeah, no. Really? It has worked. Yeah, no, it has worked. Wow. And uh, we also had a, uh, a die marker that was a uh, very uh, iridescent uh, pea green, but would stand out in the water. So if an airplane came or a helicopter came nearby and you're in the water, you could release this and would have a big, you know, color smudge that might help them uh, better see where you're at. Wow. A lot of fail safes. That's good. Um, I wonder, I have some couple more questions. What, sure. do, you, what do you think is the greatest plane made in history? <laughs> I'm prejudiced. Okay. Um, the SR-71 was so far ahead of its time. Um, I had personal time, one-on-one -on -one time with Kelly Johnson, yeah. which I treasure as much as flying the airplane. He was just in his brain. When you told him what you wanted to do, he could visualize what kind of an airplane he needed to create. And when Eisenhower wanted this replacement airplane for the U-2, Kelly kind of knew what he had to do. Uh, he had to go to titanium. He had to go to all new type of engine propulsion. Uh, all kinds of new systems had to be invented. But he surrounded himself with smart people and gave them the responsibility, but also the authority. You were asking about how do you deal with a large group? Yeah. you got a core group around you that you immediately depend on, and then they have people that support them. Uh, give me an example of Kelly's genius that isn't normally – often talked about. Well, before you do, I just want to bring context. You called him when we were speaking on the phone before. The uh, You compared him to Elon Musk. I do. For aircraft design. For aircraft design. He is the giant of the 20th century. Okay. And Elon Musk is the, I think he's going to be a giant of the 21st century. That's all I wanted to just make a mention of. Please continue. You said something that people don't realize or haven't heard well, much of. Onset of World War II. The British know that war is coming. They're really lacking in bombers. They need a um, kind of a medium bomber. They had the Lancaster. So they contacted a number of American um, aircraft manufacturers. And Lockheed at this point was doing kind of onesie twosie. They were working on the P-38 that uh, Kelly Johnson would, that was his uh, first design that's really his. And the uh, management is really not excited about Kelly going to England with some people to try to see if there's something they could do with this bomber that they were. Well, Kelly got bad information. So Alexander, he goes over there, and I think it was either a Thursday or Friday, he briefed some of the senior members of the uh, Royal Air Force that are looking for bombers, and they apologized right off. They said, we don't think Lockheed you've never really done anything in this, but we've asked the others. So you wanted to come. So tell us what you're thinking. Well, because he didn't have the right ideas, the briefing he gave was completely, you know, didn't fit what the British were looking for. So they spent time that day with the British and said, okay, what are you looking for? And so Kelly, before he left said, can I come back and brief you on Monday on the airplane you need? And they looked at him and said, on Monday? He said, yes, before I go back to the United States. And they were absolutely incredulous that they worked through the weekend, almost steady with this small team. He came back in on Monday. They had modified the Lockheed Elector, the twin tail that uh, they had used, Amelia Earhart had flown uh, a version of it, and they modified it and basically created for the British the Hudson Bomber. Before he left that day, they had signed a contract for 200 of these bombers to be built by Lockheed. Eventually, there'd be 3,000 built, but it was the first contract Lockheed ever had for a production. And, and this shows you the genius of Kelly Johnson. What do what? When you your interactions with him, what did you see in him that that separated him from the average human? Like, what was it about him? He was a tough taskmaster. Um, 
he was he could he could conceptualize what they needed to do and then he could delegate to different people this is what we need to accomplish in these areas while he's managing the overall uh, and he had quite a temper the guys that i knew that worked from ben rich who i'd later work with that was the 117 uh basically a designer and producer uh, you didn't go into kelly's office and say kelly we've got a problem right. you went into kelly's office and said we have a problem and we're we're looking at A, B, and C, and we need your thoughts on which one. Because if you came in and didn't have, you had not already done the searching, he probably threw you out of his office. He might have fired you and told you to clean out your desk. And typically, one of the guys, I think it was Ben Rich, told me he'd been fired four times at least. <laughs> that within five or within ten minutes to half an hour, Kelly had been is in the. Uh, your office. And if you were not working, he'd get, what the, are you doing? You're, I'm still paying you get back to work kind of a deal. But it was just his, he had a, um, a fiery side. He loved crew members. Um, a lot of the guys were afraid of him, which I thought was unfortunate when he was around, he came up to Beale a couple of times. And um, matter of fact, when I flew that mission into the middle East, when I landed, Back in uh, California, there was a message for me to call Kelly. He needed, he wanted to talk to me because we'd never flown a mission like that before. And he wanted, he'd heard there were some, some things that occurred. And I, so he was cleared for everything. I just called down. I found out what, uh, what classified phone to call him on. And we talked for eh, probably 20, 25 minutes because uh, he wanted to know how everything went and what were, uh, what were my observations. But uh, just a very interesting, and I pick his brain. I said, you know, what about this? And what, why'd you do this? And why'd you do that? Uh, which uh, was very enriching to get insights into his thought processes. What a man! What a man who made this all made this all happen. Essentially, without him, we wouldn't be here. But I wonder, what do you think is being worked on now? for the future of hypersonic aircrafts that excites you. It's going to have a a shape that might be a little bit like an SR. Uh, It's going to have to have different materials. It's not going to be manned um, because of the tremendous temperature. But also think about it. When you put a man in an airplane, there's a lot of things you have to put in there to support that man. Mm -hmm. You know, all the the support systems and all the other stuff. So you're going to see a vehicle that's probably going to be Mach 5, Mach 6. Uh, the Chinese have already flown some. The Russians have flown. Really? We've done some interim tests. I think something more substantial will probably be next spring. Um, in your country, matter of fact, some of the ranges out there in the outback, they've done uh, some test work with hypersonic vehicles. I did not know that. Um are you, is this, could this be the predecessor, the SR-72? It could be. Um, if they build an SR-72, a couple of things they need to do. One, they need to have it have more range than 3,000 miles. Yeah. You, you want to get away from having to be dependent on tankers every two hours. For sure. Which we were. Yeah. You also have to think about when we turned around at cruise, it took us 175 miles to turn around. If you're now flying at Mach 5 or 6, it's going to be 800 miles. So the type of reconnaissance you're going to do is a high-speed pass in and out, much like we did. We didn't. The U-2 sometimes would be in orbits and go back and revisit. Today, like in Iraq or Afghanistan, a lot of the drones, what they do, they come back periodically, let's say every 10 or 15 minutes or once a day or whatever. And they're looking at to, dip, to find changes. Mm-hmm. What's happened on the ground that's telling me that something has occurred that I, need, that I may need to know about? So when you have a, a vehicle like a SR-72, that's going to be 
you know, real high speed, you dash through, you get your sensors going, you collect, and then hopefully you come back and process it. You're not going to be going back and forth. Were you working on anything alike to that at the Pentagon? I wasn't. Okay. They, were, they were working on trying to develop, because one of the limiting factors is the engine. You know, the engine, Kelly, I know mentioned more than once, the engine defines what I can do. So like with the SR, he initially was looking at an airplane, that, an engine that would burn hydrogen. But then they determined that all of the things you'd have to do to create one, create that much hydrogen, but how do you store something? Because it's got to be a liquid that's got to be really cold and the weight that you add to be able to do something. So eventually they gave it up and took an engine that the Navy was working on and modified it extensively, the J-58. Okay. As it seems like a lot of engineering, ingenuity that needs to, considerations that need to be put in place. It's so complex. Um, one of the last places, the last things I wanted to bring up with you, Buzz, that I've never heard anyone ask you, have you or anybody you know encountered unidentified aircrafts <laughs> flying? Anything you didn't know, like, what is that? I've never seen that. Um, uh, UFOs is a, obviously a, 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 a very topical item right now since there's been some release on some stuff. Uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, Jerry, I remember his last name, he was a historian for the National Reconnaissance Organization, but his PhD was on UFOs. And he had full access to all of the classified information. So when you look at the 50s and the 60s, when most UFO sightings took place, he could correlate that 65% of the sightings they saw were classified military tests that we wouldn't acknowledge. But there's 35% that we don't know what they were. Was it a, a weather phenomena that looked like something? Uh, you know, who knows what it was? Uh, that's, that's left for conjecture. You know, Area 51, Jerry and I, because we were both, well, he wasn't so much Area 51. I was more Area 51. But occasionally we'd be at a party and Jerry would say, you know, Buzz, I'm really concerned. The aliens at, at, at Area 51, they're dying off and they're not mating. You know, what are we going to do? And, and, of course, immediately people would come in from all around. Aliens, Area 51, what are you guys talking about? Oh, no, no, don't worry about it. Just, just, he, just, he, just, just to razz people. Right, about right, right, right. Okay. Um, so in your experience and people you've – well, what was his name again? Jerry? I'm trying to remember his last name. It's Gerald – he now teaches history down at the University of Virginia uh, in Charlottesville. Uh, Haynes, I think it's Gerald Haynes. But his PhD paper was on UFOs. Interesting. I'll, uh, I'll look into him. Um, but you personally or didn't know anybody who encountered anything? Nope. Are you familiar with the Air Force pilot David Fravor? He's a bit younger than you. No. Okay, David Fravor has an account, um, one of the most uh, interesting accounts, I actually might send you the podcast he did with Joe Rogan about chasing an unidentified aircraft that he referenced at Tic Tac and his whole story and account of it. And it's quite profound and interesting. And um, once you hear the story, you'll get some context around what I'm saying. But do you believe... Like, this is just a personal thing. Do you believe uh, there is life outside of this planet? Yes. I'm not, I don't think it's in our solar system. But when you, when, uh, when you think of all the galaxies that are out there, and the more we learn from the Hubble telescope, that that number keeps increasing. And when you realize inside those galaxies, there's multiple stars that have planetary systems like our own mm -hmm. what's the probability yeah you gotta say that it, it, it may not look like life like you and i know but i think it would be almost unimaginable that we could think that we're the only 
intelligent uh, life that's ever created. And you know, there's a, um, I can't remember the acronym. There's a satellite up right now. I should say a spacecraft. Well, it's a satellite because it's going around called ISS. And what it's doing, it's looking across our solar, our galaxy, the Milky Way, and beyond when it can, and looking for star might have planets around them. And what they're looking for is what we call the Goldilocks effect. Mm. And the Goldilocks says, you've got a star, whatever kind of star you're looking at, it could be a super, it could be a dwarf, could be a red or you name it. But there's planets, and the planets are at a distance from the star that it could have an environment that could sustain water and a temperature in the range of 65 to 85 degrees. That would, and these two pieces they believe are essential for the what we understand life to be. And uh, right now we've identified a hundred planets associated with stars that in fact meet this Goldilocks uh, definition, but the closest one to us is four light years away. Well, four light years away I mean, is mission impossible. At the moment. Yes, at the moment. Um, are you familiar with Bob Lazar? Have you heard of him? Bob Lazar, no. he was a physicist who worked at Los Alamos uh, Laboratory in New Mexico on a site called uh, S4, which is like a, a site that's like off base from Area 51. And um, he's been cited in, again, another really interesting podcast about working on aircraft, not of this world, um, that they, he found, or not he found, but the, the, the government found and what we're working on to try and kind of reverse engineer and, and, and figure out what it is and use this technology. And I wonder, the government doesn't tell everybody everything. It can't, it won't, for what, all these different reasons. Maybe you know some things that you can't even say, but do you think and believe that the government hides or could be hiding potential extraterrestrial technology or life from its citizens? I don't think so. Um, it, to me, it would just be strange that uh, to want to why you'd want to do that, but um, you know, with this uh, virus and, and not being able to travel as much as I used to, I've been uh, researching some stuff, and one of the things with, that I came across that was most interesting was one of the the ancient pharaohs, and matter of fact, it may have been Tutankhamun. I'm trying to remember. But there was a knife. It, it was. It was in his tomb. And the material in the knife, um, because, you know, the tomb was found in 1922. We didn't have a lot of ways to maybe assess um, the, the composition of things without being destructive. And so because of his antiquities, they didn't want to do anything. But now fast forward, you're here in, in this time period, and the dagger that was in, I guess, on his chest or laying there to help him through the afterlife, they did an analysis of the blade. And they came upon, this does not exist on the earth. And what they were able to determine, that the Egyptians for whatever reason or however they came across had collected pieces of meteorites that had this material in it from the desert, I guess, probably West of them. And that part of the reason that when they melted this down 
was that for this pharaoh, he believed that since these minerals came from another world, it would help him in the afterlife. And I found that to be absolutely incredible. Yeah. What a, yeah. So, and we're only going to find more, right? Through more archaeological right. digs. It's, it's really exciting how much we still have to learn. Um, although when the Pentagon, which you did reference before, the interesting statement that a, uh, someone said that they referenced we have found aircrafts not of this world or off to work vehicles what do you what do you make of that i have i have I, I, and i'm being very honest i have no idea like it's not it's nothing that i've ever had any uh any knowledge or even anybody ever whispered anything and said hey you know we're doing something to this and that it's how and, interesting uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an exciting topic that people like to talk about yes. because it's the unknown. It's it's a mystery. Even to hear classified and the words non classified, it's like it's very alluring to people. Who oh, it um, is? No, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. <laughs> but overall your fascination with history is, is definitely sparks my curiosity as well. Um, but Colonel Buzz Carpenter, I had to end with the, the alien questions and the, and the more sure. obscure questions because they're fun. And it's always interesting to entertain that dialogue, but we have talked about, and I really wanted to make this conversation like a open-ended summary of your career and life, which I think has been absolutely amazing and probably the longest conversation you've had of these. And I'm so grateful for well, you taking I, the time. I have thoroughly enjoyed it, Alexander. And I, and I thank you for your interest. Uh, you know, uh, I think many of us, you, you kind of, you don't want to brag. And, and like I said, I feel very blessed that I had the opportunity um, and had the opportunity in like when we lived in Germany, the whole my I have three daughters. Yeah. The older two daughters graduated from high school in Germany. The younger started high school in Germany. And it was, you know, when the wall came down, it was all these things. Uh, and as far as my not only my job was so fascinating. But what it did for the family, it enriched their lives because I don't know if you've been to Europe, but Europe's small. You could just, you know, where we lived in Germany, Paris was four hours away. Geneva was four hours away. Amsterdam was four hours away. Uh, you could go practically anywhere and expose your family to all these really interesting things as part of your living experience of being there. And uh uh, it's up interested in traveling and they're interested which i think is important of learning about other cultures and other countries and what people are thinking and how they grow up and things like that that uh, uh are, are important i think that's a great point because it, it didn't just benefit your life your career but through your career and the opportunities you chased your family got to experience, an, and I mean, a challenging, I'm sure, because you would go away for long periods of time, but experience a life all across the world that was quite unique. It was. I lived in six different countries. That's amazing. My family's lived in uh, in Japan. Uh, the, older, the youngest daughter wasn't born at that point. And then, of course, all three in, uh, in Germany when we were there when they were teenagers. If you could live anywhere other than the United States, where would you live? Mm. I liked Europe. Uh, my mom's side of the family immigrated from Germany. Uh, but if if you were in the States right now and I invited you in my house, um, your question would be before you met my wife is, is, is she Oriental? 
because our, our home is Oriental. I, my, my dad was really into Oriental. I've got all kinds of Japanese artwork and right. artifacts and things like that because growing up in the San Francisco Bay, uh, my wife and I, because we went to high school together, uh, that's kind of what we grew up with. And living in Japan, yeah, we brought back uh, lots of things that, that uh, are meaning. I love Thailand. I love the Thai people. I love the Thai food. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and uh, Japan is a place that I've always wanted to go to. It's it's ex- the culture seems extremely fascinating and open and interesting. It, it is. They're harder to get to to know. Like if if uh, my time in Korea and my time in Japan, the Koreans are more like you and I. They're more gregarious. They make friends. They move on. They do different things. Uh, you know, life changes in Japan you become a lifelong friend. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it takes longer to establish a relationship, but once it's there, like when I left Okinawa for the last time when I was there, you know, doing my SR stuff in 1981, I came back on Air Force business in 1994 on a business I had. There was some people that ran a club. As a matter of fact, I was one of the managers of our on the board at one time and Andrew, when I walked through the door, Ito, the bartender looks, Oh, Captain Carpenter, do you want your normal drink? The vodka tonic. Wow. You remembered you 13 years. And his boss came out. Um, what was his first name? Um, Oshira. And I'd known him even longer. And uh, he immediately struck up a conversation. And they would have been disappointed if they'd found out that I had been on the island and, didn't come and not you. taken the time yeah. to come by and say hi and maybe have a drink or, or whatever. It, it, it's just a different, um, a different relationship. I mean, both cultures have their pluses and minuses, but it just, they kind of. That's why I want to extend a hand if you're ever in Melbourne. I know you come to Australia, but you haven't been to Melbourne yet. No, that's right. I I wish we had more time. My my wife, we were out for 24 days. Um, She kind of hit her because we were 12 days. I I think I told you in Australia, 12 days in New Zealand. And I could have spent a month because I'd love to come to Melbourne and I would like to go on down to Tasmania. Absolutely. Do you think you would ever take that trip internationally again? Uh, I may. And if I do, I'll make sure you know. Now, I also make an open invitation. If there's, if you have something you want to do in a follow-on, there's something that you comes to your mind that you said, oh, gee, I wish I'd asked that or wish sure. that. If it can be done with an email, then send me an email. Or, you know, Zoom conferences are easy to do. Absolutely. Um, look, I'm, I'm a, I love the United States. Uh, people who know me know that, you know, even with all its shortcomings and criticisms that the world loves to portray, I have a, a admiration and a uh, deep connection with the United States. And I know I will be back there. And if I, when I end up in Washington and or Virginia, you will hear from me. I want to see you. Done. I'm hopefully we'll do this in person. Anything else? That is it, Colonel well, Buzz Carpenter. Have a good morning, because it's your morning, and I'm going to go see how the football game's going. You enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much for the time. It was an honor and a pleasure. My pleasure. Take care now. You too, Buzz. You are watching, talking, or listening to Talking Chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. We're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe.